Fod3 on Twitter. It is an honor to be the warm up act at today's conference. Um, I haven't spoken publicly since 2016, which was at the amazing Teaching and Learning Leads conference for the incredible Anne Williams. This is for two reasons. The first, many people are already aware of. I am completely phobic when it comes to uh, public speaking, and I'm currently in a state of absolute terror. The second is that I've recently moved schools and anyone who has recently moved schools will tell you that it doesn't matter how long you've been teaching, it is like being an NQT over again, especially and particularly if you're an English teacher, I think, because when you are presented with new texts, you, very go, you quickly very go from being an expert to a novice. It's for this reason that I haven't been as educationally present on Twitter over the past two years. Although I do know people appreciate my food monument and Italian sky pictures. I think it's also the reason why I was heading down a more generalist route at the start when planning this presentation. But realizing that I had hours of content, I had to strip back and I went back to my comfort area of reading. The last thing that I actually spoke about. So it's like picking up the baton today and carrying on. So why reading and why more specifically reading cultures? I think that creating a reading culture is one of the most important things we can do as English teachers. We know the power that reading has on our pupils wider academic capability, but we also know how important reading is with regard to educating our pupils about the wider world. We want to try and foster a love for reading and I say foster carefully because there will be pupils for whom reading is not a pleasurable experience. And there will be some pupils for, for whom reading is really, really difficult. We want to try and use our influence to foster a love for reading because we know that it will make our pupils' lives infinitely better. This brings me to my bookshelf on the right. This is a bookshelf I share with Year 12 in September as part of our first lesson to consider the impact of literature and text um, and the impact that they have on us. What I, however, have come to realise in compiling this bookcase is that there are no books from my secondary years. I remember reading Julius Caesar. I remember reading Lord of the Flies, which I absolutely hated. But there are no books that I remember reading that give me an immense pleasure or had a significant impact upon me. I don't want this to be the position that my pupils find themselves in in years to come. I want them to read literature and texts that move them, that inspire them, that make them more curious about the world, that make them critical of the world and question their position within it. I want what they read with me to impact them and change them for the greater good. So how do we create a culture in which pupils' experience of reading is maximized? I'm going to talk very quickly about four key areas, knowing your readers, strategy, which I'm gonna divide into two, and finally, how we can utilize what is out there. So first of all, knowing your readers, just as we are expected to know our pupils, we should seek to strive to know our readers. The better we know our readers, the better we can support them. I was reminded of this by the wonderful Fiona Ritson this week when she posted her attitudes towards reading survey that she had shared with pupils. And I was taken back to 2017 in a reading journal I created for my own pupils. The first pages of the reading journal were made up of two surveys, an attitudes towards reading survey and an interest survey. Both surveys were taken and adapted from Donna Lynn Miller and her work in the Book Whisperer. Given out the start of the year, the Reading Attitude Survey helps me to see the reading habits of my pupils with questions such as how much time do you spend reading? How many books do you have at home? How many books have you read in the last month? What books do you tend to opt for? And what is your relationship with your public and school library? From this and their responses, I can quickly ascertain which of my pupils have good reading habits and which of my pupils are not engaged with reading at that point in time. And this helps to inform my level of support. Then there is the interest survey. This survey asks pupils about their favorite television programs, their music, their hobbies, their favorite places. Its sole purpose is to ascertain the interests of pupils, which in turn helps me to begin to think of books that I could recommend that might be of interest. There will be a point during the year where pupils come to you not knowing what to read and seeking your recommendations and knowing pupils' interests, I think, really helps to guide them with a the book choice. And of course, both of these surveys are featured at the start of a wider reading journal where pupils' reading is tracked. The simpler, in my opinion, the better. At my new school, all pupils are given a blank exercise book as a reading journal. 
What I've discovered though, is that this doesn't support reading as well as the journal here. Expecting pupils to respond in a sustained way to each book they've read makes the reading reflections quite laborious. As a reader myself, I use Goodreads to track my reading, a quick log of the book I've read, the dates added, and a quick review. I don't want to write at length about each book in turn, so in September I'm going to return to the journal style that you can see, because for pupils it's a quick way to record their reading, and for me as their teacher to keep this in check. I also do this, a very simple idea, but each pupil has one of these attached to the wall. Every time a pupil finishes a book, they get a post-it note from me, record the title and the author of the book, and attach the post-it note to their sign. This is a really quick yet visual way of helping me to track my pupil's reading and ensures reading has some prominence within my classroom. So, knowing your readers, their attitudes, their habits, their interests, I think is really key. It's like the diagnosis part of your strategy. How we create a culture of reading is then what we do in response. For me, this falls into two areas, the maximization of opportunity for reading across any school day, week, month, term, year, and the breadth of reading we offer. A strategy I found is often more successful when the opportunities are maximized and a number of stakeholders are involved. So I'm first gonna talk about the opportunities we have for reading. Now, firstly, as English teachers, we read with our pupils all the time. That is a rocket science. We choose books and we spend a large majority of our classroom time reading with our pupils. We could offer 10 minutes of silent reading at the start of a lesson. Now the disadvantage of this is that 10 minutes is not a huge amount of time and this can feel quite frustrating as you're just getting into your reading. However, as a teacher there are multiple advantages to this. One, I can quickly ascertain who has the book and who does not, who regularly has the book and who regularly does not, and I can offer appropriate support. Two, although frustrating, I am often inundated with pupils at my desk at the start of the lesson who want to share their reading with me. That passionate encounter, that enthusiastic discussion I feel is often what contributes to their continued reading. Thirdly, I can guide pupils. I'm not an advocate of stopping pupils reading the books they want to read. I'm not a big fan of limiting pupils to books within their AR range, for example. But if I send to people is on the 25th version of A Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I can have that private conversation in which I recognise the value of their reading, but suggest alternatives that I think they might also like. Classroom libraries were an absolute game changer for me in my last school, and another idea I took from Donald and Miller's book. We had a school library, but the school library can sometimes feel distant, and despite having a library lesson, it is hard to know how often your pupils frequent the library and engage with new books. A classroom library offers a more immediate solution. Cheap bookcases can be bought from Argus for £10 and I set myself a £10 to £15 limit each month to buy books from charity shops and car boot sales. Knowing that statistically those who are most disadvantaged do not always have access to books at home, this offers a viable alternative. They can borrow from your classroom library. One parent, in fact, once apologised to me at a parents' evening because her son had at least five books from my classroom library at home. Of course, I was delighted. But the power of the classroom library is ramped up further if you populate the library with youth fiction that you've read and recommend. Reading a book and then promoting this book to pupils, excitedly talking about this amazing new book you've read, reading the blurb, reading the opening paragraphs and then placing that book on the classroom library shelf will guarantee it is taken within minutes. Once after reading the opening chapter to Stormcatchers, I had to personally buy 10 copies of it because the demand was so high. Reading challenges are key. Setting the bar high for reading. At the start of the year, I tell my pupils they're going to read 40 books that year. And often there is this audible gasp when I met with, I can't read 40 books in a year. And I tell them that, yes, they can. And then I reframe that to know, yes, we can. And off we go. This year, in addition, I set myself, my year seven class and my year nine class, collectively the challenge of reading all 92 books on the nominations list for the Carnegie. I produced a list of the books and stuck this on my classroom wall, highlighted the ones that are appropriate for year seven, that's important, and off we went. Each time a pupil read one of the books on the nominated list, they were able to highlight it and write their name next to it. I've been listening a lot to the work of Caroline Spalding recently on motivation, and this collective we are going to read 40 books, we are going to read all 92 books on the nominations list, 
really has a significant impact on people's reading habits. Prior to lockdown in February here in Italy, we had read 42 out of the 92. From this, wonderful discussions about books happened almost daily, and pupils were reading books that perhaps they might not have chosen themselves. In addition, all parents want a good reading list, and the Carnegie list means sometimes your work is done. Book speed dating and other challenges. Now, obviously, I don't refer to it as book speed dating with my pupils, but it is a fantastic activity I do at the start of every big term with my pupils. I share a slide of the reading I completed over the holiday and talk them through that reading, what I enjoyed, why I enjoyed it. I then ask pupils to form two rows facing each other. The first person has 30 seconds to tell their partner about the best book they read over the holidays, and then they swap and then all pupils move to the left one space and the process is repeated. The buzz and volume of talk going on with regard to reading is second to none. At the end, I tell my pupils, well, having read all of my books over the holiday, I need some new recommendations and ask them what they have for me. Now, some people will challenge this in terms of saying, well, what about those who don't read over the holidays? Firstly, I think as a teacher, I need to know about this and again, respond to this. But secondly, I do know that every child has read a book, even if this is within class. So I tell them to speak about their favorite book or the last book they read, and it becomes the best start to every single term. Obviously, there is an opportunity for library lessons where pupils can privately read. I'm changing my approach to library lessons, and we'll talk about this a little later, but I must reference our amazing school librarians who do a wonderful job in promoting reading. Our librarian, Amber, who is amazing, organises competitions, read aloud sessions, which I have to contribute to today, and various other events. Reading in other subjects is equally important, and it's interesting for us as English specialists or leaders or literacy leaders to know what other subjects are recommending. Mary Meyer always refers to a humanities teacher who recommends reading from a publication like The New Economist. I'm not sure that's the right one, but the caliber is the same. They read an article at home, and then a discussion ensues the following lesson about that article. In my old role as literacy leader in whole school teaching and learning, once I'd established classroom libraries in English, I moved on to humanities and science and so forth and so forth, enabling pupils to have access to a wider range of literature for any given subject. Tutor time reading I first saw at Michaela and then later at Magna and Paul, and I would definitely recommend going to see these schools in action. My old school committed £3,000 to buying in tutor time books and this is simply another space where reading can occur with the tutor reading to the pupils and comprehension explored through oracy. In assemblies, assemblies are usually driven by a school's core values and there is always an appropriate passage that can be found to support a key message. Drawing upon literature in public gatherings is another way of giving text real prominence. During journeys, perhaps a bit context specific here, but many of our pupils travel in by bus each day, some a fairly lengthy journey. So there is an opportunity to read there or to listen to a podcast or an audio book. Linked reading I'll talk about later. And finally, reading with parents. I worked with a fantastic head of year in my old school. She identified after some AR testing the pupils in her year group who were below 10 in reading age. Working with a colleague of mine in the English department, she put together a program of how to support your child with reading. And over a number of weeks, she invited the parents and their children in and delivered this program, sharing a range of strategies to improve reading habits and comprehension and give them a space to read. Lo and behold, the pupils' reading ages dramatically improved. These are just some of the opportunities I've created over the years, and it would be really lovely to see you sharing via the chat any ideas you've tried at your schools to maximise the opportunity for reading. I always say that the best practitioners are the assimilators, and that's definitely true for me, so I'm after some new things to try. Secondly, I want to talk about the maximisation of the breadth of reading. I have most often spoken out in recent years about the dichotomy that seems to exist about what we should and should not be reading with our pupils. I am, for the record, anti the dead white man curriculum. Don't get me wrong, I love Charles Dickens, but Charles Dickens' voice isn't the only voice we need to hear. Since the brutal murder of George Floyd, we have seen a much healthier dialogue emerging within the education community. A dialogue that has moved away from debate and dichotomy and that is now focused on the question of breath. And that is a much healthier place to find ourselves in. 
Instead of polarizing, we need to refocus this dialogue and ask ourselves how broad is our curriculum offering? Both of these writers articulate the need for breadth in our curriculum perfectly. Reed in the new research ed guide to curriculum states, when considering the curriculum, we cannot erase writers of color, but nor should we deny the foundational place in the world of Dickens, Hardy and Bronte. We need our students to read Jane Eyre, but we need them to read wide Sargasso C2. We have to teach all of it, what has been remembered and what has been forgotten and how this came to be. Whilst Adichie, whose speech features within the IGCC curriculum, states that stories matter, many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanise. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Now, I think, first of all, we have to be role models here. We have to show our pupils that we are readers and that our reading is broad and broad in many, many ways. This is my reading this year so far. I'm a bit down at the moment, so don't tell anybody about that. But I share this constantly with my pupils. And I share this constantly with my pupils because I want them to know that I am a reader and that I read broadly. But secondly, this has to come through our curriculum offering. I am fortunate enough to teach the IB, and this is my year 12 curriculum from next year, something I'm so proud and excited to teach. There are bits that I still need to add to this. It isn't perfect. But what it does do is it tells many stories. And this is something I personally feel I have a responsibility to do as I educate our future global citizens. Now, many people will say that they don't have the luxury of this at GCSE, and I do understand this. Kudos to Excel for moving on this, and I would urge teachers to write to their examples to encourage their examples to do the same. But as always, let's not focus on what we can't control and instead think about what we can do. And I think this begins with key stage three. So, controversially, I start my curriculum with Barnaby Brockett. I say this because it is mechanical, and some people would argue its level of challenge. Well, having considered the tier two vocabulary in the BL, there is enough in there. And secondly, I've chosen this book because for the, the start of year seven, because conceptually, it is a wonderful thing to start year seven with. It is a book about identity and a boy who is rejected by his parents because of an aspect of his identity. He is released into the world and on his journey meets a range of people who have been rejected by their loved ones because of aspects of their identity, their sexuality, the choices they make, a disability. Barnaby eventually returns to his parents and I'm sorry for the spoiler here, his parents continue to refuse to accept him as he is. So he decides instead that he is confident with who he is, he loves who he is and decides to go back into the big wide world having made many friends along the way. Now, the IB has introduced me to a concept-driven curriculum, which I am currently feeding down through the key stages. And so in choosing this book, I've chosen to focus on the concept of identity, something I think is really pertinent to year seven and the changes they go through as they join secondary school. But I've also chosen to focus on the related concept of character. The key concepts provided by the IB are generic concepts, whilst the related concepts taken from the middle years programme are domain specific. But why am I telling you this? Because in being clear on the key concept and the related concept or concepts I want to address helps me to develop the breadth of my curriculum. And I just want to do an MB there to Mary, who spoke earlier about this in the week, um, a concept based curriculum. And we'll speak again, I think, at Team English. If Mary's here, she might be able to let you in on that. So within each unit I teach, I have identified a linked nonfiction and linked fiction. The term linked is used instead of wider, and this is something I've heard from either Bob Cox or Barbara Blyman. Wider makes it seem more effortful, whilst linked really emphasizes the relevance to what we are doing in the classroom. The linked nonfiction is linked to the key concept of identity and the struggles that many individuals have faced over time because of their own identity this being central to the novel we are reading. These extracts from a variety of non-fiction texts, I haven't yet decided the full range, will be offered as flipped learning, much like the humanities uh, teacher Mary Myatt references. They will be timed to correspond with particular sections of the text and brought into the lesson as a linked discussion point. There will be some core aspect of literacy that I will be addressing through these texts, but that's for another talk perhaps. 
In the main, the purpose of these non-fiction texts is to widen the discussion around the key concept of identity and to give pupils the breadth of experience. Oracy is a massive part of what we do in the international sector. And if I'm honest, we talk often of the gap between advantage and disadvantage with a focus on knowledge. But Oracy is also a massive marker for me. Having worked in disadvantaged schools for the majority of my career and also with one of the most elite private schools in England and now a fee paying international school in Italy, one of the stark differences between pupils is their confidence in expressing themselves in having an opinion, in debating and discussing in a sophisticated way. And whilst I understand that you need knowledge in order to be able to do that, it is something that needs to be given more attention. So at IB, all students undertake an individual oral in which they have to do a 10 minute presentation on how a literary text and a non-fiction work presents a global issue. I think this is something that could be done in a much more informal capacity at Key Stage 3 to help pupils reflect upon the impact that texts have on them. So towards the end of my unit on Barnaby Brockett, I'm going to ask my pupils to choose an extract from the novel that has had most impact on them in conveying ideas about identity. And I'm going to ask them to choose one of the extracts from the non-fiction bank that they feel has really spoken to them about identity. And then I'm going to ask them to reflect upon how both texts have conveyed key messages in relation to our key concept. I'm thinking I'm going to set this as a homework task and ask pupils to produce a loom or a screencast or a PowerPoint presentation with audio, given our newly developed technical expertise. And then these can be shared via one of our school platforms. I'm thinking that I'm going to direct pupils to watch two to three of these presentations and comment on these presentations and allow the person who is presented to respond. The focus here very much is to empower pupils to consider what it is they have learned about our key concept, reflect upon the power of text in conveying those messages, and to develop oracy skills in the process, utilising the structure from the IB. So on to linked fiction, and this is where I try to present myself as a reflective practitioner. As we've given greater consideration to curriculum design, many English practitioners have argued for a curriculum that is chronological. I've never felt that that quite works for me, but having seen the awe-inspiring Kat Howard and really reflected upon her work, I do think it is important that pupils have a good grounding in the literary timeline and understand whether texts they study fit within that. But curriculum planning is complex, and if I don't want to teach my texts in chronological order, how could I broach this? Well, I've decided to centre my library lessons around this. And as you can see here on my curriculum map across Key Stage 3, pupils are introduced to each of the literary time periods so that by the time pupils finish Key Stage 3 and begin their IGCSEs and their IB curriculum, they have a solid grounding of literature over time. So what might this look like? Again, taken from the brilliant Kat Howard and Susan Strachan, my sequence of library lessons will start with a lecture about the given literary period. So when exploring Old English or Model Eng Middle English, I will give a lecture on that time period, providing an overview of key moments, key influences and key aspects of that literary period. Pupils will then be exposed in a number of library lessons to extracts from that literary period. However, these extracts will be placed within a wider anthology that can be explored in later library lessons. The anthology will be organised around the related concept, so in my unit on Barnaby Brockett, the related concept is character. And so my first anthology is made up of character descriptions. The first idea being that pupils need multiple exposures to something in order to be able to understand it and then construct their own. The second idea being that when they come to write their own character descriptions, they have a broader range of exemplars to draw upon. But these character descriptions are placed within a literary context and organized chronologically. They are referenced within their literary period. And when you start to look at some of the characters, there is a lot contextually that can be drawn out. Each extract will be accompanied by a number of activities that address the concept of characterization and the literary period from whence it came. But having read the wonderful Chris Curtis's blog last, uh, last week, sometimes we can just read for pleasure's sake. In trying to approach it in this way, I'm hoping to increase the breadth but also provide my pupils with the opportunity to develop a richer understanding of the different literary periods, which will really support their future learning. In unit two, when I look at poems from different cultures, the linked fiction will focus on settings, for example. And finally, I want to draw all of this reading together. 
our main literary reading, our linked fiction reading, and our linked non-fiction reading. And I want to do this using oracy. In Italy, pupils in state education sit what is called the Terza Media exam at the end of year nine. As part of this exam, pupils have to present to a panel of teachers their learning from that year. It starts with an essay that draws upon a range of disciplines and then moves into questions from a panel. Although terrifying, I think this is an excellent opportunity to promote our reading across the year and our reflections of this in line with the key concept. And so I'm introducing a Terza Media style presentation at the end of each year within Key Stage 3. For example, in Year 7, our concept, as you know, is identity. In Term 1, we explore Bernard B. Brockett and the theme of personal identity. In Term 2, we explore poetry from other cultures and the concept of cultural identity. In Term 3, we explore a range of extracts from Shakespeare's plays and focus on the female characters to consider gender identity with a bit of Disney thrown in. We have also, by this point, explored a range of linked fiction and non-fiction reading. Around four weeks prior to the end of the school year, I will provide pupils with a question. The question for Year 7 will be something like, how important is the written word in conveying ideas about identity? And from this, I will ask my pupils to create a five to 10 minute presentation exploring how successfully the texts they've studied across the year have conveyed ideas about identity. The text they choose to refer to will be up to them, but the focus is reflecting upon their reading across the year with a key concept in mind. In doing so, what I'm hoping to invoke in my readers is a sense of the impact that texts have on us and our understanding of ourselves and the wider world. And so finally, when thinking about reading culture, I think we should use what is already out there and available for free. Read Theory is a reading platform that provides pupils with short extracts and associated questions. I currently use this with Year 7 as part of their homework program, and next year the department will be using this tool across Year 7 and Year 8. Read Theory provides pupils with a pretest which ascertains their grade level. It is American, so it needs to have a quick conversion, but it gives you a sense of their reading ages. The blue line is the current grade level pupils are in, so as a teacher you can quickly see who is above, who is on and who is below. Once the pretest is done, pupils use the short extracts and quiz on these. You get a wide range of information as a teacher, including the results of the quizzes, and the different colours tell you how many answers were below pupils' pretest score, how many were on and how many were above. Having worked with this programme for a year, it is of no surprise that in the main, the more quizzes pupils took, and the more success they had with these, the more their reading ages improved. And after doing student feedback, at least 75% of my year seven students really felt that it benefited their reading. Now from year nine up, however, we use another free program called Common Lit. Again, passages, longer passages are provided with a range of questions. A pretest is provided and a rich amount of data from the pretest is shared both in terms of performance but also in relation to key skills such as comprehension and inference. What is amazing about Common Lit is its growing library, with many extracts and into core literature texts and organised thematically. That offers you a wealth of texts to explore. In addition, there are a number of features which are so useful to support pupils with their reading. You can enlarge the text. You can have the text read to you. The text can be translated into a wide number of different languages. You can annotate the text. The features are endless. Again, there are guiding questions and assessment questions which pupils complete. And in the main, these are marked for you and the data fed back. It is a brilliant tool. So finally, I'm pretty much coming to the end of my presentation. These are some of the things that I would like to work um, on next year. I would like to develop book reviews and I'd like to do more shared book reviews, maybe through Firefly. We do have a YouTube channel at my school and I'd like to have an English section on that and some video book reviews would be amazing. I'd like to get regular book reviews in our weekly school newsletter. I'd like to extend the challenges that I do with my class across the different year groups. And this period of time has shown us that anything really is possible. Getting authors over to us here in Italy is somewhat harder, so maybe we could do something more remotely. I'd also like to promote our reading for pleasure, but also to enhance our subject knowledge, especially if you are teaching text for the first time or if you're an NQT. When I know what I'm teaching, I try to get my hands on absolutely everything to do with that text to improve my own subject knowledge. 
If you can, ask your HODs to buy one copy of everything for your departmental library. Utilize the blog posts, use the lectures from LitDrive to read, 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 and read again, and make sure your subject knowledge is the strongest. And finally, this is my final slide. These are my go-tos when it comes to reading. I think Alice has surpassed me in terms of her reading knowledge, and she's absolutely fantastic at offering ideas and suggestions for reading on Twitter. Simon and Ashley are fantastic um, primary practitioners who are always talking about reading. Disappointingly, Ashley's hair isn't like that in real life. Um, those are the four books that have influenced my thinking the most with regard to reading and will continue to do so. And of course, I can't um, not recommend the Carnegie List, which for me always frames my uh, reading with regard to youth fiction. Um, I am rubbish at asking questions, but please feel free to obviously get in touch with me um, via Twitter, um, via FOD3. That is me done. Thank you, Freya. That was brilliant. That was amazing. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen, please, so we can do the questions? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So first of all, great job. We've had like more than 920 people watching a presentation here. Plus, this is all live streaming on YouTube. So I don't know how many people are watching there, but lots. So thank you very much. And there are a few questions that were asked during a presentation. Uh, so Alexandra asked right in the beginning that she says she likes the idea of I am reading poster, but how does that work really is it with tutor groups? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, I think you need to decide whether it's going to be more of a curriculum thing or a tutor group thing. For me, I like doing it with my English classes. I am conscious I have a year seven group next year, so it might be something, but there is then that problem of you running out of wall space. So I think you have to choose whether that's going to be a curriculum focus or a, a tutor pastoral focus. Yeah. Uh, and then also about one of the techniques that you shared, Loretta asked, how do you manage to do the post-it note on the wall when you have hundreds of children going in and out of your classroom? How does that actually catch you? Um, sellotape help. Right. Um, and putting them in spaces potentially where, um, where pupils won't rub up against. I'm, I'm assuming physically. I mean, I don't have full names on the, the wall, so I just have a first name if that's from a, yeah. from a different angle. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so some more bigger questions now. Uh, a few people saying that they don't have a lot of funding in their schools for libraries and books. Do you have any advice on how they can get more funding or any alternative if they come buy books? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. That is really difficult. And I was really, really lucky that my old school were really supportive of that. I do think it has to come down to how supportive your SLT are in terms of reading and how much of a focus that is for your school. Um, I think also one thing I did try at my old school was reaching out to the to the community and saying to the community, we want to build classroom libraries. We're really keen to build classroom libraries. Right. You know, are there any books that you finished with that you could contribute towards? And I remember actually a number of parents bringing bags of books to our school to, to contribute to that. So um, I understand that is a real, real problem. And I think actually it's a long term thing, isn't it? That you buy new books every year with what you have. Uh, so also talking about schools with different backgrounds, uh, Jade asked if you have any ideas for promoting reading with students in a pupil referral unit. Really good question. And I have no experience with pupil referral units. So that would be something that I would want to think about. I, I mean, I am rubbish. Sorry, Jade. I'm rubbish at answering questions on the spot. And I, think great. I prefer to say I'd like to go away and think about that um, rather than give you a really rubbish response. Um, I think it always comes back to that enthusiasm of reading and choosing books that tell great stories. For me, when I'm choosing my books on my curriculum, um, I am thinking about the stories that I know will engage my readers and offer some challenge. There are other things to consider as well, but I think great stories and your enthusiasm and love for, for reading would be my initial response, but I would definitely have to go away and think about that. Yep, yep, that's great. Uh, there were nice questions about parents. So how important is it to motivate parents to read as well? So increase this culture of reading with parents, not only with the children. 
Absolutely. I think it's really, really critical. And I, I do think it's something that um, here in Italy, in my school, we, we have a lot of very supportive parents who understand the importance of reading and the value of reading mm -hmm. and are on board with that. And they, they are pretty um, good at wanting reading less than we're currently putting that together for summer because that is an expectation. The head of year work that, that um, Kirsty, my ex-colleague, did was absolutely fantastic. And I think that's a really good opportunity and a good way to start. Um, and I think other parent information evenings and parent support evenings is, a, is, is another good um, opportunity. Um, but yeah, that is a real, real barrier. And it is massively important that parents are supportive of reading and encouraging reading and sitting down with their children with reading. But I do think um, having uh, looked to the work that Kirsty did, um, a lot of parents don't know how to support their children with comprehension. They don't know how to support their children with improving their reading. And so what that workshop did was really open up that dialogue and say, this is how you can support. This is what you can do. And I think the more we communicate that, the, the better. Yeah, that, that's very good advice. Um, Caitlin asked if you incorporate writing tasks as well into each term. When you're doing the reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't spoken about writing and I haven't spoken about writing because I don't consider myself to be uh, such an expert on that. And actually, I've just started the amazing C Teach program and it's going to be one of my areas of focus. But absolutely, writing is, in, is, is absolutely central and uh, at the heart of what we do. And the character descriptions thing uh, that I was talking about, they will go on to write their own. Uh, character descriptions right. and having read Jenny's work and looked at Jenny's work I'm going to do one writing lesson every week that will then layer up to that character description at the end okay yep sounds good uh, another question about uh, leadership how would you recommend I didn't get the name of the person who asked sorry uh, how would you recommend getting your SLT approval to create more time in the timetable for reading they saying that they only have five minutes at a time for tutor group reading. Doesn't seem a lot. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And I haven't done deer for a long time. Um, I think it's about going back to the important, again, I'd like to go away and think of what I would do strategically and give myself some time to think about that because I think that's a really important thing. I mean, I've always worked with SLT teams who have really valued reading and understand the importance of it. Um, I think tutor time is a really good negotiating space for that because um, we're always looking for things to do with regard to our tutor time and activities there. But um, yeah, I, I would go away and have a think about that. Sorry, rubbish response. I am rubbish at questions. No, that's great. Um, so some people asking for recommendations. So first ideas for books for 16 plus, so older kids and also Mandy, I think, asked, what book have you ever thought, thought that had the most worthwhile response from your students? Oh, amazing question. So um, with regard to book recommendations, um, I think Alice is an absolute expert. I, I think Alice is on here. I would always refer people to uh, Alice. I think she's overtaken me. So I don't read as much as Alice. So Alice is the, is the expert there. What I would say with um, the older students is, again, try and link it into the books that you're doing. So I'm teaching Chronicle of a Death Foretold. So I would probably go back to the core themes and the core concepts and books that relate to that. Um, in terms of the most worthwhile, I have to say, hands down, this year, Long Way Down has had the most impact on um, my pupils, both from a conceptual point of view, but also from uh, their reflections in terms of how much that book has taught them about poetry. Um, so long way down for me, the most impact. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, that was fantastic. We're out of time now, but thank you very much. There I'm going to have a wine now. <laughs> there are still other questions. Uh, so everybody, if I didn't get to ask your questions, just go on Twitter, tag Freya, tag Seneca, use the hashtags, and then she'll answer them there, right? Perfect. Great. Yeah, do get in touch with me via Twitter at FOD3. Yeah, amazing. So thank you very much, Freya. And now our next speaker is Patrice Miller. So, Patrice, are you there? All right, I've just unmuted myself. Yeah. Um, and I've got to find my screen again. Um, 
Sorry, I knew this was going to happen again. Uh, it's all right. Just go for share your screen. <laughs> there it goes. Share. Okay. Yeah. Is that showing? Yeah. Okay. All right. Lovely. Oh, so, uh, oh, just wait one second. Oh, here we go. Okay, there you go. Okay. So, hi, hi all. Um, my name is Patrice Miller, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how I ensure maximum impact and progression within my classroom. And arguably, there are various ways in which this happens, but within the time constraints, I'll be talking about one specifically. Um, just a brief introduction about myself. So, I teach English, and I'm also the Year Seven Achievement Lead. Um, in a East London school, so the school situated on East, in East London, but also on the Essex borderline. And it is considered a school to have high levels of disadvantage. We're looking at 44.5% pupil premium, and that does equate to be just over 440 pupils. Okay, and our grades sit between 61 and 62% for across both English subjects. So there's still a lot of room and a lot of growth needed for improving those benchmark grades in both subjects. So a uh, key ethos that underpins our uh, pupil premium strategy is this um, idea of quality teaching first. Okay, and this is found this is founded on based on the Sutton Trust in 2011. And quite strikingly, over a school year, pupils with quality teaching pupils can gain an extra 1.5 years worth of learning. So it's quite significant, and it establishes the importance of Im implementing quality first teaching, especially for the disadvantaged. And I think if we look at the last sentence where it says for poor pupils, the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher is a year's worth of learning. So it's it's quite a lot. So one way in which I find, um, in, in which I maximise progression for the pupils that I work with is by modelling. And when I refer to modelling, I'm looking at, in for the purpose of this talk, I'm looking at specifically writing. Um, Pi Corbett in 2008 defined modelling as a teacher and learning strategies used by teachers to talk through their decision making process. So modelling requires a lot of teacher talk. So modelling of writing requires a lot of teacher talk. And this is quite, this can be quite daunting. I mean, when I first embarked on this journey of modelling writing in front of my pupils in the classroom, um, it was daunting from a perspective where I, I can write well and I have written well and I've demonstrated such, um, good writing in the past, but then to sit in front of 24 to 28 pupils in the classroom can be considered quite intimidating. So it does require a lot of teacher to talk and it also requires actually exemplary behaviour management. On my, when I first did this, you know, I can tell stories where actually it became a car crash because the setup within the room wasn't exemplary. So it's really important. And I think modelling is also an important strategy for improving student writing and maximising impact. It's because it, the second um, bullet point, it's teachers are able to demonstrate a new concept. Now, our learners or our pupils, they've been writing throughout their whole school career, but there's a lot of poor writing within that or weak writing, shall I say. If we think about the new concepts and using quotations, how often do we all see introduced quotations and people say a quote that shows this is. So the demonstration of um, through the demonstration of new concepts through writing would be to teach pupils how to use embedded quotations to meet the assessment objectives. Again, it's those um, looking at writing strong thesis statements that meet AO1. Too often we see. Priestley uses adjectives in an opening statement. So by modelling what a successful piece of writing looks like, we're able to demonstrate a new concept or a new way of writing. And I think the last one means a lot to me because it says it, uh, modelling is defined as a way in which people are able to think about an answer to a question completely and concisely. And I think that's really important in allowing people to meet the assessment criteria or the writing criteria. Um, as I said, I consider myself to be an expert writer in my classroom, and I'm not, but I'm not perfect. And I think by modelling writing, um, by modelling writing with the use of a visualizer, 
students are able to see me correct errors, ensure grammar compliance, and use a range of sophisticated vocabulary. And I think that kind of demystifies the writing process. It makes it less intimidating. And I would make a case that this is just as important in key stage three as it is key stage four, because if we, if I find that if this is embedded well with key stage three, it kind of leads to automaticity later on in the later years and um, promote that perceptive judicious writing. So just to continue with why I use modelling, I find that modelling responses and use of academic language is a linchpin to successful writing. The best way to say this is, you know, if we think about how the nurses recently have been a linchpin to the NHS, modelling writing and modelling academic language is the linchpin to successful writing. I find the two are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And if there's a focus on higher order vocabulary and placing a strong emphasis on the shape and form of a successful piece, students are able to really engage with this. I find that whilst I'm modelling, I often get people to write um, my, my piece in their own books in possibly a green pen so that they can become familiar with that. I find working with um, my whole career, I've worked with disadvantaged children um, and I find that when I give them a task like listed below, they often feel apprehensive and overwhelmed at the thought of writing. There seems to be a huge distance between how do I get from the task to completing the writing and there's often these questions of how do I use those posh words, writing like this is only for pupils in the top set. Um, it's not for people like us. So by demystifying the writing process through modelling, they're able to access that kind of textual articulation. And most importantly, I find that modelling limits the number of low quality submissions that I receive from pupils. And it moves, uh, it moves beyond that historic PEE, point evidence explained. I will make a case that there is a place for it. However, um, to achieve the higher um, boundaries or between the higher grades within writing, pupils need to move beyond that structural and procedural writing. And I think um, modelling quality response enables me to do so and, and address so that people's going to address the AOs in a perceptive, judicious and creative form. Um, historically, modelling in my practice looked like this. It was less about sitting by the visualiser and um, acting out or performing or writing um, a piece, a, a response to a text. It was more of, here's the task and here's one I did earlier. But I found recently that, as I said, it's, there's still that distance. Pupils are still unable to see how I got from the question to the response. So I kind of moved away from using this in such a, why I favoured using the live modelling as opposed to the model answer. I mean, the model answer is valuable. There's a place for it. But again, it's just the demystification of writing um, is allowed and afforded by using live modelling. So what do I use nowadays for modelling? Well, in my place of work, we have what we call the golden rules. Now, I don't know where the golden rules started. Um, I don't know how we how they came about, but I absolutely love them. And I would have this, people know that when they're creating an analytical piece, these are the key features that will need to be included. Okay, so when I'm modeling, I am demonstrating that people need to make a clear point, moving beyond mentioning language techniques or structural features within the opening sentence, actually providing a strong thesis statement. Quotations is a big thing, and I mentioned that briefly earlier. So by modeling, I'm able to show people how quotations flow within sentences, not just spontaneous and introduced. They don't need a grand introduction. And so forth, but I, I do find that people are able to, the people have improved the quality of their responses and this is the expectation for all students in key stage three and key stage four. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to share that with you today and that's, um, yeah, I hope that's helped. Hey Patrice, thank you. That was brilliant. That was very good. Um, and we have questions for you. So 
let's get them going. Um, first of all, uh, a lot of teachers asking for recommendations on uh, books or other reading that they can do to you know, start doing modeling in their classes. Any recommended literature? Um, books and reading. Um, Sorry, it's just relaxing now after um, yeah, that's all right. going through uh, that. So my mind's I'm gone gonna... a bit blank. I'm not very good at questions. <laughs> Let's read the, uh, so I'm just going to read the question out loud. Maybe I just didn't ask them right. Are there any books or blogs specifically on good practice for modeling writing in English? That was the question. Uh, when I first embarked on this journey, um, I, I was a fan of um, Andy, Far Andy Farby's um, work, and he mentions quite a lot about reading about modeling writing in there and um, Jenny Webb's book um, spoke about that too and I found them quite quite useful um, and uh, yeah so they, they they're two that come to my mind yeah. right now yeah, yeah. so I'll make some notes on Twitter about books I have read on that there is yeah that'll be great there, yeah I'll just share them on blank. yeah just share them on Twitter <laughs> later that'll be yeah. great um, Steph uh, said that sometimes she struggles to think of how to write amazing pieces on the spot. So do you prepare yours in advance or do you just practice a lot and then you get good at doing it on the spot? Yeah, I mean, as, as I said, when I try, I remember trying this out first time and I thought I could do it on the spot and I actually find it quite intimidating and quite daunting. Yeah. So what I found myself doing is actually preparing the response beforehand so that Again, it allows me not to be thinking on the spot so much and, you know, I can better manage behaviour if I've got my, my piece there. I mean, people don't know I have this, that piece there and it can be considered cheating if you like, but it enables me to make sure that the writing I want my students to see has all the key features, meets the criteria and it doesn't, um, so it doesn't allow for, um, I don't know, just blank, blank mind, a blank mind. Yeah. Uh, and just following up from that, there was a question from Roberto asking if you model your thinking process as well with your students. Yes, and I think that's an important part of modelling. That's quite an integral part to modelling my thinking process. So modelling why I'm choosing a particular adjective to zoom into or why I've chosen to mention this part of the social and historical process. I think that's important so that pupils can then um, have that same full track when they are to writing. Yeah. Great. And uh, how the question, I think, from Shona, how do you promote this level of complexity with the lower prior attainers? Yes, and I think it's, I, I feel more confident using this with lower prior attainers because um, you just, again, it's about modeling uh, grammar compliance. I think that's things they struggle with, spelling compliance. And with lower prior attainers, I've noticed the difference in terms of the work they have produced by seeing me practice and making this practice an integral part of a lesson. So it's not just, I don't model on an ad hoc basis. I try to, as much as possible, use this every lesson so that students are becoming familiar, possibly over familiar with how to write. Yeah, great. And um, I guess just more important for the moment right now, do you have any strategies for increasing student participation during lockdown? How are you doing <laughs> the modeling during lockdown, distance learning? Um, we've moved towards Loom lessons and I'm guessing that um, by using Loom, Loom lessons, you, could, you know, it, it falls that time and space to model writing for pupils. Um, it falls that time and space where you can record yourself going through the practices of writing and written articulation. Yeah, sounds good. And just before we run out of time, uh, a bit of well, advertising, I guess, people asking for recommendations on which visualizer so I'm currently using um, the Ladybug Visualizer. It's a red, it's quite small and it's quite discreet on the desk and I find it, it's amazing. You know, click a button and it just works. There's no complications with it at all. So that's the Ladybug Visualizer. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, Patrice, <laughs> thank you very much. That was great. Uh, can you just tell everybody again how to get in touch with you, please? Uh, yeah, you're more than welcome to, if you have any further questions that I can probably better answer when I'm not feeling so nervous, um, just... Mm -hmm just at me on Twitter at Patrice Miller underscore. Yep. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and our next speaker is Kat Howard. I've just okay. done myself earlier, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, no. okay, so. 
Can you see that okay? Yeah. Brilliant, lovely. Um, hi everybody, there's so many people here that um, I'm so glad that um, Fro and Patrice went up first so I can gather my thoughts a little bit. Um, thank you ladies very much. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, um, for just yeah, um, coming along and, and listening to what we've all got to say. It's, it's, um, it's a little bit overwhelming I think. Um, um, so I'm Pat Howard, um, you can find me on Twitter at Sesmith. I'm Assistant Principal um, overseeing uh, CPD and English at the Dust school in Northampton um, I run um, Lick Drive so I kind of um, deal with all that kind of thing if you've not come across Lick Drive um, it's a resource and CPD provision for English teachers um, which is probably why it's worth mentioning and um, last but not least I'm author of Stop Talking About Wellbeing um, and it's it's kind of with all of those different hats I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about curriculum and curriculum curation for all um, and I'll kind of unpack what that means a little bit um, I've got um, a book coming out with Claire Hill in September that kind of unpacks all of the thinking that I've been doing since last year when I kind of put um, stopped talking about wellbeing together. I originally wrote a couple of bits around curriculum and why it's so integral to our sense of purpose um, uh, and and how actually a lot of the work that we do around curriculum is is so interconnected with how we feel about going into work every day. And I kind of mulled that over for a little while and had loads of discussions with Claire and said you know this this isn't working I've just kind of sat all this writing in a, in, in a pile and don't really know what to do with it and we kind of unpacked it and so um, it's led to to where we are um, with the book coming out in September which is really exciting so um, I'm going to be talking to you about kind of the link between the curriculum particularly English curriculum and why it's it's so important and actually irrespective as to your role within school whether you are a classroom teacher who you are one of the most integral parts um, to the curriculum curriculum because you deliver all of that work all of that hard work that's gone into the preparation um, but how actually we all have this kind of professional duty to be thinking about curriculum um, and, and it be as I said this really kind of there's so much synergy between how we feel about work and um, generally how we feel as teachers um, and, and the work that we carry out of the curriculum itself so if I kind of unpack what I mean by, by the type, first of all, curriculum curation for all, these are the kind of key overarching questions that I'm going to be talking through to, to really unpack what I mean by that. So first of all, kind of explore what, what it does mean to curate the curriculum and, and what, I, what I kind of mean by that, that question in itself, that statement in itself. Um, where we all feature, so as I say, kind of depending on your role within a school, um, how that kind of, what that looks like to you. Um, or what that looks like to me and how I envisage that that should look if we want to feel good about going into work every day. Um, what questions, particularly as a subject lead or a specialist of your subject, which I would argue we all are, we all, all are kind of academic in, intellectuals of our subject, what we might need to think about and then kind of practical strategies as to what, what we can do next. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is English specific because I think there's so much that when you're talking about curriculum that we need to kind of move away from that genericism and understand the underpinning principles of our subject in order to be able to talk about curriculum effectively. Um, so what do I mean by curating the curriculum? Um, I think that we sometimes and historically have talked about curriculum like it's something that we can crack and like it's something that we can finish and I think that um, and Mary Mike talks a great deal about this about the curriculum never being done and the curriculum always being this ongoing continual process and actually from a, a standpoint as if we're thinking about teacher purpose that's really difficult for us to get our, our heads around in the fact that the great deal of professions you have an endpoint you have these milestones and with teaching we don't have as much of that and that includes the work that we carry out around the curriculum because we essentially have this thing this core purpose of working on curriculum and working on English curriculum and you want to feel like you're making progress but actually that that progress is almost the work rather than the endpoint itself 
So there is no end point with the curriculum. And I think a massive part of our role as English teachers is making our peace with that, that actually this is a process that we're going to come back to time and again, this process of refine and review and, you know, and, and making things better and improving over time. And, and being OK with that, that you're going to be working on curriculum until you retire is probably the biggest struggle that I think I've gone through over the last few years as a teacher of, kind of putting the curriculum map together and going, oh, the sense of satisfaction that that's done I, I won't be able to do that and and it's it's making a piece with that definitely and um, I think it's about understanding that curriculum does not equate to for the exam and completely eradicating that language from the conversations that we have around curriculum is so important um, I think that there's a great deal that has unfortunately historically been lost along the way from curriculum planning in schools as a result of we need to do this for the specification it doesn't appear in the final exam we need to duplicate what the final exam looks like when actually there's so many other ways that we can um, give students a really rich experience of our subject without having to even think about articulate you know what it looks like in the in the final product because as we all know um you know if you're as passionate about english as um as i as i think majority of people that are here this morning are uh, there's so much more to english than a gcse um and coming out with a grade four or five you know that's that's not what i want students in my classrooms to be remembering about my subject about the fact that they did that question three that they really nailed it and then when they got the exam they knew what to do of course there's a place for that and that's important but that's not why I teach English for um, and so when I talk about curating the curriculum I'm definitely definitely not talking about that um, I don't think it's skills led I don't necessarily feel that a skills led curriculum has any longevity that we have to work with our core and hinterland knowledge if, if anybody wants to read more around that Christine Council and um, is very much your go-to but with skills if you're leading with a skills led curriculum or skills progression the issue that you then run into is that you're holding this kind of measuring stick up for students without actually having anything to measure it from it's very very difficult to measure a skill and um, we also know a skill in isolation, I mean, without knowledge to kind of hang it to. Um, we also know that um, by using skills, we're almost setting students up to fail because we all know those year 11 students that walked out of the school still not being able to analyse, still not being able to put an analytical paragraph together. And if anything, it's, it's quite dissatisfying, both for a student and for yourselves as well to go, OK, well, we're going to master skills, actually. And it takes our attention away from the glorious knowledge of our subject, I think, overall. Um, last but not least, I think to talk about curation of the curriculum, and I'll talk about this later on around collaboration, um, we have to make our peace with the idea that it isn't owned and, and, and kind of view our roles as teachers, as subject leaders, as something that the curriculum is in a possession. It's, it's not to be carried out by one or two key people within a faculty, within a department. It's the work of everybody because it is all what we're coming into work to do. Um, and so I think that, again, um, thinking to my experience and the conversations I've had around curriculum, um, this sense of ownership, this sense of curriculum as a possession, as one or two people's responsibilities. For example, your key stage three lead, so you need to plan key stage three. It's actually de-skilling um, faculty kind of staff as a whole. Um, and, and ultimately, I think we have to go back to the idea that we are all designers of the curriculum, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so yeah, that's my next question, there we go. Um, so where do I feature? If you're um, a senior leader, you, you are not an expert of the subject. So you're probably the, the kind of the, the person that's least involved in these conversations and thinking about what needs to be on the curriculum map for English. Your subject leaders um, need to be empowered to have those conversations, need to be empowered to make those decisions at subject level. So I view very much my role as a senior leader, obviously I'm an English specialist so it's a little bit easier if I'm not managing English, um, but if you have an, a senior leader that's, um, that's not an English specialist managing English, of course that can work, they can be asking the right questions, but their ultimate role is to make, is to create the right conditions for those subject leaders to feel really empowered to carry out that work. 
Um, if you're an English, if you're a classroom teacher, again, it's coming back to what I said earlier, that you are essentially one of the most important components in that process because all that preparation that goes into curating the curriculum, you're delivering it, you're trying to work out a way of translating our subject for those students. And actually, that, that's a really, really important, vital component of carrying out the curriculum. Um, I think we also have to think about when we're thinking about the fact that everybody is designers of the curriculum is how we're creating again i'll kind of give you a couple of practical practical examples of this later on about how we are creating um, opportunities to create effective mental models for how to work collaboratively um, so again if i come back to previous departments that I'm, I know other people have worked within where one or two people and this is kind of on the back of a lot of conversations I've had recently um, around curriculum is that it's not the what of the curriculum that sometimes we struggle with but it's how how do we collaborate how do we make sure that it's not just one or two people how do we create how do we create really effective mental models of decent conversations around curriculum so that those NQTs or early careers teachers that are coming into a department see that in action because they're our curriculum designers of the future. In five years time, or however long, they're going to be sat strategically leading a subject. We need to make sure that those people are well equipped to have such conversations to encourage collaborative action and collaborative work around curriculum. So that's really important. I interviewed Christine Council to stop talking about wellbeing last year and I, I, and I didn't use it and I've on to some of that gold um, that I wanted to share with you today. Um, so it's quite nice because it's, it's just it's not from a book, it's actually a conversation that I had. Um, so she said to me, you very being as a teacher from the world go, should be thinking about what you're teaching. If you're not thinking about what you're teaching, then you can't be teaching well, you're just a conduit that the stuff informs what you teach, how you pack a subject, how you shape it, how you really uncover and unpack a subject for children is fundamental. And so if you are, particularly early careers teachers, if you're coming into English, you know, congratulations if you're going to be an NQT this year, or you're in those early stages, do not think for a second that what you're thinking about, what how you're thinking about what you're going to teach isn't important because though your opinion and your academic accolade as such that you're bringing to that department um, is, is really valued. Otherwise, we're just sending people in to teach the stuff and actually they need to be part of the process to prepare the stuff and what's come before they actually walk into the classroom. So it's really important that process of symbiosis. Um, so on the left hand side is everything kind of summarised because I think I need it there to, to think about pitfalls. So why am I talking about this? Why am I not talking about what should be on your English curriculum and I'm talking about how or why instead? Um, mainly because on the back of the curriculum CPD that I did a little while ago, this was the majority of my questions um, that kind of came through um, via DM and conversations that I had on the back of that curriculum. So a lot of people said you really fired me up to think about my curriculum, to think about the diversity or how it's a historical response to literature and uh, literature is a response to history but I don't know how to do it for the setting that I'm in I've got we've got a head of department and they like to do everything or we've got a key stage three lead and they they plan all of key stage three and so it was the pitfalls that I wanted to kind of focus on so various pitfalls this isn't my job there's a great deal of kind of in some departments around this idea of what well, that person does it um I think as well, curriculum planning for people, it's really, it is hard, it's really hard. And I think I learn all the time when I think about the curriculum, I'm constantly feeding off um, other people's ideas to inform me. And so it can be quite daunting, it can be quite quite um, overwhelming to think about the idea of, of putting curriculum planning together. And we need to make sure that we've got continuing professional development, again, which I'll come to later on to support that. We can't just say, we're all going to work on curriculum. There has to be the structures in place to do that. So I've not been trained to do this. I think that, and I'm guilty of this, my training didn't necessarily prepare me for the for curriculum planning or thinking about the curriculum in the way that I would like and the way that I feel provides a decent menu to the students I teach. I wasn't prepared for that at all. Um, and so thinking about that, that nine times out of 10, that's, that gets in the way, it acts as a barrier for people. Um, other people will do this job more effectively and I think again if we're thinking about how um, curriculum planning is, is carried out, yes there is of course an argument that you know you want particular teachers to deliver areas that they have expertise in. If I have a Shakespeare expert I'm going to want them to have an input in, in um, you know planning for the, a, a unit on the Tempest for example but I also want those individuals that aren't as experienced to be in on those conversations which is why collaboration is so key. Um, 
and I have other things that take priority. And this comes back to, um, I think it was, um, Frey was saying, was saying about the role of the senior leader, you need to have the right conditions for, for this sort of collaboration, for this sort of synergy, for this sort of kind of work to take place. Um, and so if it is the fact that you feel that your time is being taken by other things, um, that's probably what Stop Talking About Wellbeing is about. Um, but it, 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 you need to have a senior leadership team that um, that understands that the priority should be the curriculum and that everything else pays servant and kind of you know pays service to, to that. Um, but that's probably a talk for another day. <laughs> so, what questions should I consider? If we're thinking more subject specific, because it, it's as I say, if we're thinking about kind of curriculum work as a whole, there's only so long that you can speak generically about kind of what that looks like before nailing in and, and kind of um, drilling down to to our subject English as a whole. So, how, I'm going to talk through just and um, for those people that have, have kind of seen. When I've talked about curriculum previously, this will ring some bells and I've also kind of tapped into the wonderful Sally Stanton on this, maybe um, gave me lots to think about. So if we're thinking about curriculum creation overall, well that's fine, yeah. Um, I think it's coming back to that idea um, that nobody, it doesn't belong to anybody. Um, it's not perfect, it's never going to be perfect um, and we need to be quite ruthless when we're looking at curriculum. Um, so it, we, you need to create a culture in your department where nobody is precious about anything that is sat on that curriculum menu because actually um, nothing is safe on a curriculum map. There's very few capsule pieces that we say that is going to stand the course forever and ever. So you have to make your peace with that before, before you go in and start picking things apart. And it is very much a critiquing process. So as you'll probably see, my, my two first questions there are slightly more critical than looking for the bits that work. I don't want to know about the bits that work first of all, I want to know the bits that really don't work. So where are, what's least connected? You look at your curriculum up as a whole, what doesn't make any sense? What doesn't connect to anything? So if we're thinking conceptually, again, Mary's written a fantastic blog on this and I know that she's spoken earlier this week, Mary um, Hunt Portley that Freya shared. Where are your key concepts being threaded through the curriculum? Are you returning to, so for example, you're returning to the, the aspects of tragedy are you returning to the aspects of morality are you returning to gender representation throughout your key stage three to key stage four curriculum um, and and uh, what doesn't pay service to those concepts um, I think we and that's kind of along the lines of what's least useful I think we unfortunately and again I, I've, I've listened to a lot of conversations around curriculum where um, you you go, well, I don't really know why it's there, but it's always been there and we really love teaching it and the kids love it. So, and do you know what? That, it has to be, again, to quote Mary Myatt, it has to be useful and beautiful. You have to know the purpose that it serves as well as the fact that it really provokes that curiosity. I'm not saying there's not a place for that, but I do think that um, anything on your curriculum has to serve both of those purposes. Um, what is the heritage and ancestry of your curriculum? And Sally Stanton kind of, plug that that question in there for me what's previously been disregarded and that's a really important question because if you're coming to a curriculum menu if you're a, a new head of department and head of subject head of key stage coming to the first time it's really important that you understand the journey that your curriculum has been on to that point not necessarily because it will change or inform your your decisions about what sits on the curriculum but it will help you to understand maybe what's been included before that, that didn't work and didn't work for your context. So much of curriculum is, is context specific. It has to be right for your school at the time that your school, at the place that your school is in. For example, the curriculum work that we've done with Dustin now, I would argue with my you know, knowledge of Dustin might not have been possible four or five years ago. It's very much a journey and it's a response to that. Um, it's also worth thinking about the heritage and ancestry of your curriculum as to who's put what together. Because if you're having conversations about removing elements or making more of those links, it comes back to the how, it comes back to those conversations as to um, are you ripping out the same person's work if you've had that, that previous issue around ownership of one or two people planning out the curriculum and putting all of that preparation together is it just one or two people that you're going to cause that point of contention with and you have to work out how to have those difficult conversations but it's it's good to be informed about that as you're going um, I also think as well, um, disregarded pieces, just to have a quick moment on that, is that sometimes things that have hit, sometimes units that have, put, have been put in your curriculum that didn't work didn't 
not work, awful double negative. It's not that they didn't work because um, you didn't, um, because they, they weren't fit for purpose. So for example, Merchant of Venice, delivering Merchant of Venice at year nine, it's been done before, it didn't work. It might not have been the fact that it was the text, it, but it might be the way that the text was taught, the way that it was put together. And so again, it's very much back to having those conversations around the table, making sure as a subject leader, particularly, that you're enabling, that you're, you're creating opportunities for people to have those discussions. And that those discussions are healthy ones, if we're thinking constantly about the how of the curriculum. Last but not least, once you've ripped everything out and thought really critically about your curriculum, what are your capsule pieces? What are the representatives of our subject? So if we're thinking Shakespeare, but what, what extent do they enable us to spotlight the contentious issues of our subjects? And so we're not just talking about dead white men, um, but we're actually enabling diversity into our, into our curriculum. We're not shying away from that. I think that's really important. Um, and that we're presenting our subjects in such a way that we can have those contentious and um, those conversations around contentious issues within society. I want um, my students to know about the suffragettes and how actually they, you know, the, 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 the horrific mistreatment um, that they underwent in um, through force feeding in prison. I want my, my students to know that. I don't want to shy away from um, the fact that Medusa, you know, essentially was a victim rather than this terrifying Gorgon um, and, and how much actually she, she wasn't to blame for her circumstance. I, I want my students to know that. I don't want to shy away from that. So think about how your curriculum serves to, to ask those questions and have those conversations. Um, I also think just before I kind of sorry I'm really really going to power through this because I've squeezed so much in um, I also think it's really important that we are mindful of cognitive bias um, we um, all have our favorites when it comes to English and our favorite texts that we want to teach and it's important that that doesn't get in the way of those questions um, I'm guilty of that a lot um, so if we're thinking about kind of collaboration think about how many eyes um, are that the, the, the work that you carry out around the curriculum passes over. So to what extent was that curation or will that creation be um, curation be a collaborative process? How many people are, I'll call it touching for want of a better word, how many people are touching those units as they pass through the quality assurance process as we have those discussions so that we can continue to refine and improve what we do over time? And that's not just necessarily the QA, the formal QA in schools when we're kind of looking over workbooks or looking over um, you know learning through um, through being in the classroom and seeing that teacher enact the curriculum but how many people saw that preparation process and how can we enable opportunities to do that as a quick example so that I don't run massively over um, um, how we've managed to do that and, and counter that remotely is that we've um, kind of we've mapped everything, our entire curriculum out on a spreadsheet, worked out what the priorities were, worked out how to review everything across key stage three, four and five, which I'm really excited about. It's probably the, I feel like the best way that we could have used this time while we're sat working remotely. And each unit of work was put together by one or two people. So, it, and, and the amazing work that has come through from, um, from some of our English teachers as a result of that collaboration, I'm incredibly excited about. And I've shared that with, with so many people this week. So it's just fantastic, it's really exciting. Um, but also each unit is, is informally reviewed using agreed standards that we've put together, a one page document, it's on my blog. Um, so that, um, it's not the key stage lead, it's not anybody with any sort of agenda or motive about that they are accountable and responsible for that key stage, but it's just two other teachers having a discussion with you, a critical discussion with you about well, why is that there and why did you decide on that sequence and why did you choose that particular text to choose to teach that particular concept and do you, do you think that I've taught this before do you think that that would work better than that and actually I've seen a really fantastic reading source on the British Library that might work well we could you know chunk that down for key stage three and use a paragraph or two here and having those fantastic subjects so that everybody gets to experience that process and everybody gets to see what everybody else is doing to improve the quality as we work it's really really um, interesting as a subject lead particularly but I would argue, I'm going to come back to that 
everybody is a designer of the curriculum argument because I, I want you, if you're sat there as an NQT in five years, to be in a position to deliver a subject. So I want you to be able to experience that along the way. And um, to what extent could you teach all aspects of your curriculum? And I'll hold my hands up. I'm, I'm not a linguistics expert. I'm not a language expert. Um, my key stage theory is another teacher. I hope they're not here because so it's embarrassing. But they've put together this incredible gender and power unit. Um, as a result of um, being language experts and teaching language A-level. Um, look having looked at that this week, it's really exciting, but I, it already makes me want to go away and read around um, what they've done and further reading to, to enable me to teach that particular unit. So think about to what extent you could teach all aspects of the curriculum that you've designed for yourself. And if there are areas that you do feel less confident with, then that's your priority. And where do you place this, yourself as a subject expert with the curriculum? So it's kind of um, kind of one and the one and the same. Okay, so what's next? What are you meant to do with all these big ideas and this information? Um, I think about um, and I wouldn't I'd argue that this isn't just for subject leads. Um, but where are there opportunities for collaboration? Um, and that's collaboration on a, on a department level, and that's collaboration in the wider field. You have Lit Drive, and I have, you know, what some 40 plus regional advocates that will talk to you all day um, about literature if you'll let them via Twitter. Um, um, if you go to the Lit Drive page, you can see everybody that's a regional advocate on the extended team page. Um, but where are you providing opportunities for not just you, but your team, if you're a subject lead, to have those conversations to collaborate on ideas so that we can have as I say many many people touching our units touching our curriculum as we continue on that journey and um, where, where are you having conversations that ensures that we all understand that it's a contribution and not possession that this view the curriculum as this kind of you know untamable monster the curriculum is Taliban <laughs> um, and we're trying to work with him and to not enslave him and put him back in a cage but it's this idea that nobody it doesn't belong to anybody it's nobody's possession um, nobody is kind of solely accountable this is very much a, a collegiate process um i kind of talked about the, the power of collaborative networks i would argue that um if you're particularly if you lead on a key social you know if you are looking to take a more active um, role as a participant within your faculty around curriculum and um, thinking about where those opportunities are to develop people within your teams so subject specific CPD obviously I'm massively biased because of lit drive but subject specific CPD um, needs to take place to enable people to feel confident and not daunted or intimidated by the concepts of, of curriculum planning and um, not just because of the fact that we want amazing curriculums in our schools but we want to keep people in in teaching and um, that's really important and this is on um, the this so the I don't want to call it silver bullet but this is the surefire way of us doing that um, because ultimately it, it takes us back to our root purpose of what what we came into teaching to do in the first place um, so um, the book's out in September. It kind of talks around um, the various stages of curriculum, but that symbiosis between curriculum and classroom and how that can work, how that can work, not just provide a really good uh, menu for students, um, but to also provide um, a really kind of strong sense of purpose for you as well. So that's on as a pre-order at the moment. Thank you very much for listening. I ran slightly over. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me just stop sharing. Hey cats. No, thank you. That was right on time. No worries at all. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. And there are lots of questions for you. And then obviously we still have to announce uh, something, right? Uh, yeah. That's coming out today. <laughs> I can't wait till now because I haven't got anything to say. <laughs> uh, no, let's just go through the questions first and then we do that. Yeah, right. no So uh, a few questions here. Practical questions. What time are you allocated for curriculum planning, both individually and as a department? In your yeah, so uh, as a whole school, we, we really invest a lot of time. So actually it's increased meeting time, but meetings with purpose. So if there's nothing to talk about. We won't have a meeting for faculty, but it's an increase in faculty time um, with a real kind of focus on making sure that we have those conversations around curriculum and subject enrichment. So for English, um, particularly before I, before I came to school, there was a particular 
um, focus on subject enrichment in those meetings. Next year, we've also hunted over 12 hours of um, CPD time, of directed time, um, with subject and subjects will um, kind of curate their own CPD in response to the needs of, of the faculty. So for example, we carry out subject knowledge audit or just have a conversation with your faculty. What is it that you need? What is mm -hmm. it that you're not confident with? And then curate CPD to match that. It's really important, I think, to work alongside um, that the curriculum, you know, the, you could do all the work in the world in the curriculum, but if you're not carrying out CPD to support that, it's kind of fruitless. Yep. And uh, just talking about the department, if somebody has colleagues who are still very much clinging to teaching for the exam, uh, how do you start a conversation with them? Yeah, I think I think the, the the issue is is that there's so many different ways. I'd, I'd say arm yourself with knowledge. Um, there's a great deal out there on the kind of impact of multiple choice questions and how incredible that can be for knowledge. Um, if you read kind of um, Michael Young, powerful knowledge, or even I'm just going to just read this book. And then um, what you do is you kind of highlight places or you bookmark um, this book from Mary, um, you bookmark bits and then you just leave it in pe people's pigeonholes or photocopy bits and leave it in people's pigeonholes and almost be like this kind of curriculum fiend um, <laughs> because um, there's so much more that we, we, we achieve great things at the exam by moving ourselves away from it's just for the, the exam. Um, and Mary is, is much better at articulating that than I am. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say very quickly that next Thursday, Mary will be giving a Seneca webinar on Wednesday at 5 p.m. So if you want to come and listen to her speaking directly about that, just do join on Eventbrite. Back to you now. Uh, there was a question from Becky. So you're talking about knowledge and skills. She's asking what really goes under each category in English. Oh, Why wow. are you grouping? Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't really... <laughs> I, I see skills, okay, to reframe that as practice. And as soon as you reframe that as practice, I think it makes a little bit more sense. So the knowledge of the subject, and again, Claire's written some incredible work around um, different areas of knowledge that we need to consider when we're thinking about curriculum. Um, but the, the knowledge of our subject, so the core knowledge, the, the facts, the figures, the terminology, um, and what Christine Council talks about as the hinterland, the stories that we use to teach that core knowledge. I wouldn't, I don't necessarily see skills as skills, it's the practice, it's practicing applying that knowledge. So students being able to interpret that knowledge as their own through pieces of writing, through reading responses, through discussion, there's a great deal of kind of placing the merit on the thinking um, and not the doing. Um, and that that's how I kind of see things. So you've got that core knowledge, that terminology, the analytical verbs, evaluative verbs, all of that are the kind of tools that enable students to be able to articulate that knowledge for themselves. Yeah, good. <laughs> and um, there are two questions that are similar. So one of them was any advice for schools which are part of a uh, MAT and then they have a one size fits all curriculum. So you, the school itself cannot really go against what the academy yeah. trusts and it, say. It, and uh, sorry, just the second one is yeah. what if your head of department is making all the decisions and not really talking to the you classroom teachers about them yeah to so kind of pick up on the first one i think that there is a place for you know for packaged curriculums and bespoke curriculums and it fit it, it sometimes fixes schools that are incredibly broken um where there's been nothing there so i definitely think there's a place for that and it, it's coming back to that journey where is your school on, on on that journey to kind of mastering curriculum you you can't just kind of send people out and go talk about curriculum without training and thinking and unpacking and exploring what that looks like so i would argue that there's kind of there is a place for that and maybe your school is on an earlier journey um with regards to the the second one around kind of one person wants to um a good get around for that is just kind of asking to trial with your class um, so try a particular maybe a particular approach or you know using the same text but doing maybe something that you want to do with it or drawing from um, some of the amazing resources that Freya shared common lit and um, the academic reading to go alongside text it actually links to particular texts common lit so it's really handy but just trialing with your particular class I think and once people see the success of that um, it grows from there you know I think that we move, need to move away from dogma of don't do that do this or don't do that do this and actually just build on what works that's a much healthier approach I think yep uh, 
there's a more direct question here from Salian. How do you feel about the complete segregation of the language and literature curriculum? I think that they are two subject disciplines. Um, I think that because so much of language relies on um, context and culture and our response to that, and I think that's much more fast moving than the world of literature, um, you know, particularly, couldn't be more pertinent at the moment, our response through language um, and how interesting that is. So I do agree with this kind of sitting as, as two discrete disciplines. Um, I think that it comes back to your concepts. Our concepts of the world are discovered through literature and that's kind of where you can make those links for students, explicit links of, if, for example, the way that we kind of do it is these four overarching concepts of tragedy, morality, gender representation, and I'm gonna to struggle to think of the other one. I think it's other or segregation. It's something, it's something around segregation. Um, but coming back to those concepts and actually finding texts that explore those, those concepts is a far richer experience for students to then make the link between the two. But the, I, I do agree that they do kind of sit as two separate entities. Okay, yep, sounds good. And uh, what about interleaved schemes? So linking reading and writing, do you use those concepts? I think that interleaving um, in some examples can be done really well. I think yeah. that sometimes it's um, been misconceived, kind of um, misconceived and bastardised as being done really badly, where we're kind of jumping around from one text to the other. Um, I think interleaving very much comes back to um, your retrieval, so constantly making those explicit links um, between. And if anybody watched, kind of, it's science, but it's it's. I think it's useful to see it in action. John Hutchinson did a, a talk that I think is on YouTube somewhere around this about making it really explicit to students those conceptual connections of where have we seen this before? What other character represents these ideas? What other character has represented this particular concept to us? Where have we seen a character struggle around morality and this idea of morality before? So if you're teaching Jekyll and Hyde, obviously it's really explicit to look at morality and then you can tie that to, you know, Eric in Inspector Calls or any of the Burlings about this fact that they they struggle to see that they've done anything wrong because it for them it's about the legal sense and not the morality not the moral sense of what they do so i think it's about kind of approaching it in that way yep uh, and uh, there's a nice question here from caitlin now so if you were trying to go over the curriculum and just make changes would you go and do each key stage at a time or would you look at the bigger picture to try to have like a bigger plan in mind i think you have to look at the bigger picture and i think yeah. that's what makes it really difficult it's really hard because it's like um, it's a rubik's cube you know it's it's this idea that if you touch one thing if you take one thing out then essentially you know you're pulling all the threads of the other things and so yeah i, I would argue that even though it's far more difficult and especially difficult to do collaboratively at the moment um, it's worth the hard work to look at it as a picture of a whole because if you're coming back to conceptual thinking um, you need to make sure that those kind of those lines run through of those that we're coming back to the same ideas over and over again we're just using different texts or different characters um, or different ideas to kind of and um, to demonstrate them um, and you, you need the whole curriculum in front of you to do that I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah uh, last week on the geography conference they kept calling it a seven-year journey oh so, yeah 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 because science talk about the pillars so yeah yeah so maybe i think that's the same similar idea mm. um there was a comment from angela saying that a level english has seen lower numbers recently so mm. she wanted to know if you have any my thoughts, thoughts I, think, on that. Yeah, I think it just comes back to our unfortunately i think when the specifications change for gcse um naturally um some people panicked and and we reverted back to and that's what we do and you see this in the the current climate as well that we've all started talking about recovery curriculum and what recovery curriculum can look like when actually recovery curriculum is just teaching really really well and doing what we do best um, and I think that we maybe reverted back to that panic of we need to make sure that we're getting the grades because we don't know what the grades will look like we don't know what a four or a five is and so we reverted back to that and I think that now we're seeing the knock-on effect of that the impact of that through our a level numbers because as a student you're not going to be motivated you're not going to be motivated alone it's that intrinsic motivation that you need to be interested in the subject beyond getting a grade for it yeah and uh, i'm just going to follow up with uh, ruth's question here she just asked so she works in a 11 to 16 school 
So how do you work with them if you don't know what kind of text they're going to study when they move on to A-levels? Oh, okay, when they're moving on to A-level. Yeah. I think, but I think the key concepts of literature and what we, what we aim to do with literature, to, you know, not to get too grand about it, is very much the same. Um, and so, yes, there's a place to look at the, the, the mechanics and the, the specifications. Um, but actually, if you think about literature as an art form, um, we're exploring those same big concepts all the way through. So if you're doing that, and if you're mindful of that when you're putting your curriculum together, I think as a natural evolution of that, you will prepare them for the next steps. You cannot deliver a world-class curriculum and fail those students to, to, you know, to, to enable them to prepare later on. I think, it, I think you know, you, you, that's a natural almost side effect of what you're doing yeah. by creating a really meaningful, engaging, you know, exciting, diverse curriculum that looks at those big ideas in society. Yeah. Uh, last question, because we're out of time. Um, what are your absolute key concepts? Yeah, I think, I think it comes back to if you just think about this, what you want students to understand about society um, around, you know, around them. So it comes back to, for me, it's gender. Gender has to be an issue there. Diversity or, or, or segregation or other or difference. I think there's so many interesting conversations to have around the way that literature has handled that through time. Um, morality and, and legality and crime and punishment. Again, I think that, um, that there's definitely a place for that. I also think that we need to focus on, for us, Cells for our own CPD is this presence of biblical illusion um, and, and coming back to understanding how the Bible actually has, has influenced um, so much of what is present um, within our curriculum. I think that's a really good starting point. If you're a classroom teacher, get to grips with, with the biblical illusions um, because that will present those key ideas and give you such an informed understanding of those um, yeah. in order to teach, I think. Yep. Amazing. So uh, thank you very much, Kat. That was fantastic. Uh, just going to let people know now that Kat hey. has a free, just launched this morning, a free CPG course based on her book, Stop Talking About Wellbeing. Do you want to tell people a bit more about what yeah. the book's about and what the course will cover? Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, so it's just, um, I think it's very pertinent as well because the, the segment of the book, so Stop Talking About Wellbeing was uh, thinking about taking a pragmatic approach to workload reduction instead of cake Fridays and yoga on a Thursday and thinking about how we can structurally and individually improve um, our workload and our, our sense of purpose as a result. Um, Seneca have taken probably the most pertinent for this talk um, the conversations and communications part of, um, of that book and turned it into a leadership course which is absolutely fantastic and so if we're thinking about the hows and the conversations especially how we managed to do that so there's a segment on email in there which I think is quite um, quite pertinent and um, then yeah go check it out but um, yeah. it's really exciting. Amazing great so that's the big announcement that we just wanted to share with you today there is this free CPG course based on Kat's book that is available on Seneca Learning. I just shared the link on the chat and I'm going to share that on Twitch as well. So go for it and you even get a certificate at the end. So brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Kat, again. Thank uh, you. We're going to go for a break now and then we'll be back at 11.20 with Mark's talk. So please be back at 11.20, everybody. See you soon.
Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Hope you're back. That was the end of the break. <laughs> so I do hope everybody's back. So we can start the second half of our conference. And I just want to tell you the hashtag Seneca CPG is trending number two on Twitter. So that's brilliant. Well done. Good job. That is amazing. Uh, thank you to all of our previous speakers and already thank you to the upcoming ones because this is really, really great. So, uh, and also I just shared the link to a blog post that has then the link to CAT's um, CPG course. Okay, so that's how this works. Uh, and now our talk is from Mark. Mark, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm just about to share my screen now. Brilliant. Yeah, go for it. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, that fine? Everyone see that? Okay. Yes, that's working. Brilliant. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Roberts, and today I'm going to be talking to you about this annoying phrase that you will have heard many times, I'm sure, uh, come out of students' lips that you, you can't really revise for GCSE English. Uh, and this is going to be something that you're going to hear many times throughout your career if you're, if you're a trainee or a, a new teacher. And, and it, it's something that I think is holding back many students from, hold, from reaching their true potential, this annoying misconception that English is somehow uh, special as a subject that um, impedes revision. Uh, just going to briefly tell you a little bit about myself to begin with. Um, in my day job, I'm an 11 to 18 comprehensive mixed school uh, in, in West Devon uh, teacher in there. So I'm an English teacher. I also work as an assistant principal leading on CPD, uh, teaching and learning and research. Uh, but when I'm away from school, I do quite a lot of writing. Uh, so I'm the co-author uh, with Matt Pinkett of Boys Don't Try, Rethinking Masculinity in Schools. Uh, I write frequently for the TESS uh, and EMAG, which is a, a brilliant magazine for A-level uh, English language and literature students. Um, in my TESS columns, I try to make sure I chuck lots of English subject knowledge in whenever I can. And as well as that, I've also written the introduction to a couple of the Collins classic uh, set text series, um, which has been brilliant because one, one thing that I, I've tried to do throughout my career is just keep on working on my English subject knowledge. And I'm, I'm talking to you about English today and, and trying to give you a few ideas and a bit of expertise, but I just keep on working on it. And, and I don't think there'll, there'll ever be a stage like what Kat was saying about the curriculum's never done. I don't think there's ever gonna be a stage where I'm gonna say, okay, I've, I've got Romeo and Juliet nailed. I've written an introduction on it and there's still parts of the, the text where I think, okay, I can probably teach that by next year. So that's gonna be, be something that, that will sustain me and hopefully there'll be a few things that you'll pick up today that will help you deal with this idea. Now, the, the key elements of this talk are based on my, my book, which is, is coming out, well, it's coming out soon, actually, isn't it? It's, it's available for pre-order now, and it's called You Can Revive GCSE English. Ironic title, Yes, You Can, uh, and it's aimed at students. And the idea is that it, it's moving away from the traditional revision guide that talks to you about the, the what, what you need to know. And this is really how, and it offers a step-by-step -step, um, approach to the entire revision, but that many of you be interested in it. And English teachers who've taken a look at it so far have said to me that, that it's something that they want to buy because it, it does offer this assistance when you get these kind of ideas from students about what can I do to revise English. Uh, so if you look at the contents, we, we look at things like uh, how to memorize quotes, um, which quotes are the most important ones to focus on, um, looking at things like the unseen extracts from GCSE language, so it's not just focusing on literature, it's got things like unseen poetry, which tends to be a real uh, concern for even the most confident students, and also looking at what you can do to pre prepare um, ideas for the creative writing questions as well. So hopefully at the end of this talk you'll, you'll want to take a look at it and uh, let me know how you get on with it if you do get a copy. So this is going to be what I'm going to focus on. I know that you know that students can revise for GCSE English, that this, this annoying myth is, is just that. Um, but what does that look like in practice? I'm only going to be able to give you a flavour of it today. Um, we, we don't have time to go into every element of, of, of the revision process. I'm just going to talk about five key areas. And as I go through, I'm going to show you a few things and 
you probably want to go back and, and, and have a look at the recording if you want to look at some of the examples in a bit more detail um, because I, I will inevitably have to kind of rush through a few things. So the five key steps that we're going to focus on when we're looking at GCSE English uh, success is understanding the idea of revision and how we're going to communicate that to our students, uh, looking at effective strategies like retrieval and spaced practice, how we as teachers um, can make sure that we're modelling each stage of the revision process, thinking about this idea of pre-preparing content, which is a big theme of, of the book and a, and a big feature of my uh, teaching. And then finally, I'll just have a quick word with you about keeping their motivation levels up, which is always trickier when they've got eight, nine, ten plus GCSEs to focus on as well. All right, so first of all, I think that as, as English teachers, we need to be really careful around our language when we're talking about revision. Traditionally, revision was always seen as something that was done towards the end of the course, you know, revising from February onwards or, or whatever it may be, or as they approach um, an end of assessment unit or their mock exams or, or whatever. Um, I think we're going to be really careful and make it clear that revision is something that takes place from, from day one, from lesson one, whether you start your GCSEs in year nine or year ten, that you are, are, are setting them work, you're setting them homework that's going to be saying this is part of your ongoing revision process. And the emphasis is going to be frequent um, bursts of revision, little and often throughout the course. It needs to be interweaved and spaced and we have to be really careful about how we set homework and also how we set things up during lessons to ensure that this is not just something that they see as, as work that's done at home, where you just go over stuff that you've done um, over the course. It's not just going back and making sure you've learned stuff, it's being able to apply that previously learned material to new topics. And, and this is absolutely key. So as teachers, we've got to set them up um, for revision for effective revision, but it comes from the messages that we give as well. So what might this look like in practice? Well, the research tells us that most students take really rubbish notes. Uh, and I was teaching a year 12 student for EPQ last year. She'd got a couple of grade nines in, in English, so she was really bright, but she didn't have a clue how to annotate uh, these journals that I'd given her to read. And we spent one uh, whole lesson where I sat down and, and, and showed her this is how I annotate these are the notes that I make when I'm reading journal and uh, criticism and, and so on and, and that was something that was like a revelation to her no one had ever shown her how to do this before um, so we cannot make those assumptions that students will know how to do something which to us is just as simple as taking notes and some of you today will be, will be trying to take notes as I'm talking, and we've got to forget that there are real difficulties, even for experts in taking notes. If I suddenly start speaking really quickly and go through things very speedily and, and rushing on, you're going to be like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. And, and, and we have to be really careful for thinking about the inherent difficulty of note taking at times and some of the mistakes that our students can make, unless we're very specific in the language. Make a note of this, this is really important. This is a key idea that I want you to take down, things like that. So many uh, teachers have come by the idea that showing students how to down on notes is an effective strategy, and it, it is. And, and in the book, I spend a lot of time going through and showing them the step-by-step -step guide to being able to, to use Cornell notes. Uh, and, and it leads up to examples such as this, where students are using questions as a prompt to be able to then go on and, and have more detailed, useful notes as summary that, that, that they can go back and look at when they're, when they're revising. And if you look at the, the bits in red, those are summary parts and it's, it's helpful to try to get them to use a different colour for that reason so that they can go back and, and skim and pick out the key ideas. And that's great. But one thing that I look at in the book is, is a technique that, that one of my uh, previous students, who Molly Bolden, who is now um, studying English at Cambridge University, that she uses Cornell notes, not just for when she's um, taking notes uh, during lessons or anything. She, she uses them for handouts, for textbooks and, and so on. She, so that there's this really systematic approach to making sure that everything is building towards being able to have organised, helpful notes for revision, whatever you're reading. 
So for, say for example, you give um, your, your students some critical reading. Now this is an example on my last book that's taken from the Foundation. And they read through it. And previously they might online a couple of words and they're not really sure what it is they're going for. If you use the Carnell note system during lessons while you're doing this and using them to do this at any time, you start to get far more effective notes. Uh, if you look at those kind of things, you, we've got a couple of key questions there about the form and about the key symbolism behind the parody. Um, and it enables them to really pick out what is the key aspect of this critical reading that I'm doing and how can I then start to incorporate this into my own ideas. We also know from the research that most students use ineffective study techniques. So they like to cling to their high library. They like to feel that this illusion of fluency where they're really reading notes because it feels more comfortable than testing themselves. And most students like to leave it until too late and, and, and try to, to cram uh, for exams. I was reading something recently which said that, that the average amount of time that some students spend on exams is four hours of revision. Now that's truly terrifying isn't it? So we've got to make sure that for those kind of students we be building these techniques into our lessons. So I know that lots of you will have already used retrieval based practice within your, your lessons and will have spoken to students about the benefits of, of using these techniques which show this real high utility, this high effectiveness. And that's great. The big problem that I'm looking into recently shows that even oh, when Mark. you speak to your students, yes, yeah, sorry. Hi, sorry. Uh, your sound is going a bit off. I don't know if it's internet connection, but can you try switching off your video? So there's only sound coming. I think that should probably yes, make it no. a bit better. Yeah, no problem. I can do that. Sorry about the interruption, but we no, want to hear what you're saying. So. No problem at all. And everybody else, please switch off your videos as well. Okay, everybody. Okay, right, okay, is, yeah. that, is that better? Yeah, that sounds better, yeah. Okay, great. So I was, I was just saying that, that despite the fact that lots of teachers spend time um, teaching their students about the benefits of, of retrieval and space practice. There's recent research um, that shows that even when students are aware of this, they still end up falling into these bad habits and going back to the, the study techniques that are, are seen as, as easier and more comfortable to them. So that's something that happens. And it's particularly true of, of boys that towards the end of the course, if they've left their revision until too late, they start to then abandon these study, effective study techniques and, and start to revert to the ones that they've been told not to use. So this is something that we've got to absolutely guard against. So how can we do this? We need to make sure that these techniques are fully integrated into our lessons and in the homework that we set. So that leads us on to the, the second part of, of today's talk, uh, using effective retrieval and space practice in lessons and during homework. Well, we know that quizzes and multiple choice questions are, are really effective. Kat was talking about that earlier. And we know this, and that's fine. I'm not going to spend time um, going over that again. I'm just going to talk you through a few of my favourites uh, that I've used over time. Um, Single word quotations is something that I stumbled upon. I think I was I was late after one uh, hectic uh, playground duty at break time. I came back in and my class were waiting for me. I was like, okay, nothing planned, nothing ready. I've not got the time to load up my PowerPoint. What I'm going to do? So I just wrote down some words off the top of my head that were were from some of the the key quotes from some of the texts that we've been studying. So you can see on the on the screen there. This this is not my uh, to do list for for this evening. This is some words that are taken from actual uh, quotes from actual literature texts. So if we go and have a look at these, you you well done if you spotted any of these. That they're taken from the Power and Conflict um, anthology for AQA. And then there's a Jekyll and Hyde, a Romeo and Juliet, and a DNA uh, quote there. And these become really useful because what you can start to do is to, to use nice little um, themes like I had there, or you can make sure that they're all starting with the same letter, or they're all using powerful verbs, or best of all, and, and I give some examples in the book of this, is using uh, words, so for example, blood or bloody, 
that, that come from multiple texts and it forces students to make links between those texts and to think about these kind of high utility words that they can think about or, or words that, that are featured as motifs within the same text for example are, are really useful too and just to create that nice extra layer of desirable difficulty I also will, will pick out the less obvious words from some famous quotes so think of um, a plague on both your houses from Romeo and Juliet. You might give them both rather than houses or plague and see if they can come up with it then. And it's something that students can then start to do as part of their own revision. And it enables them to go back and, and, and ensure that they've learned some of these best quotes. Odd one out is another nice one when it comes to looking at, at comparing and, and thinking a bit more laterally about uh, ideas about which character is, is the different one or which particular scene is, is, is different and the beauty about these ones is there's not always one right answer that it might be that, that, that different students can come up with different reasons why why they stand out uh, so it creates lots of really interesting discussion that, that can be a springboard into into more uh, detailed uh, discussion for later on in the uh, the uh, lesson some of you will have seen the, these kind of start for five activities which are brilliant because it ensures that you're thinking uh, about students work being interweaved and, and, and spaced so that you're going back and covering things that you're not just studying at the moment things that you've, you've not done uh, for, for a while as well and it's really important that we model that going back over and, and making it part of, of each lesson that we're going to be looking at different texts one key thing to, to point out actually is if you're asking students to, to answer this for key quotes from Simson, for example. And if I were to say to someone, can you give me a quote? And then someone else, can you give me a quote? I'm not stretching them in the same way. And it can give you this illusion that, that students have got the right answers. I need to be saying to, to the same individual, can you give me four quotes to make sure that they, they don't just have one and they don't just have this surface knowledge. So be careful in your questioning when you're doing that. But increasingly, my favourite way of using retrieval practice is to move away from just using it as, as a memorising of, of key facts and plot and ideas and really focusing on to, to deeper thinking and, and setting up the kind of statements that will allow students to, to really go into more complex ideas. So I usually give them these kind of statements, which are, are usually quite definite, um, and then in our discussions with the students, they, they can unpack some of the ambiguities that are there and we can find a few more nuanced ideas. Uh, the second one was, was based on a little discussion that I had on Twitter the other day with Chris Curtis about whether when the prince banishes Romeo, is this just a plot device or is there some more symbolic meaning beneath it? So these kind of things will, will allow students to then go on and start tackling essay questions with these kind of really interesting retrieval ideas there in the background. So when we get on to the, the third stage, we've already had um, from Patrice this really excellent explanation of why live modeling is, is key. It's absolutely important though that we don't just use live modeling for, for doing um, paragraphs and, and essay questions and exam questions and so on, and that we're, we're modeling each stage of the process. So I talked earlier about showing my student how to take notes, and that's something now I do with all my classes. I don't make assumptions that they, they can annotate effectively. We show them how to make flashcards and how to use them. We pick out the, the most important quotations. I, I show the, the mistakes that can happen with context and then how to avoid them. And, and I also make sure that I'm, I'm doing what Patrice showed beautifully earlier, this idea of um, drafting and redrafting with my creative writing. So what might this look like? In the book, I, I spend a, a, a chapter where we look at some of these killer quotes, some of these absolutely essential quotes, and try to, to narrow it down to the top five quotations in each of the texts. And, and by doing this, you can say, okay, well, you've got a paragraph that's, that's prepared for, for this one particular quotation on a particular question. Can you make it fit uh, a different exam question? Can you make it fit this exam question? Can you make it fit one that it doesn't seem to fit with? Uh, do, does it still uh, apply? So this is really good practice um, in classroom and at home as part of their revision. Context is an area that even with my most confident students, they sometimes get the balance wrong. And, and this is from my experience and from the exam board feedback. And I use, I use this in a lot more detail in the book. These are the things that can go wrong. So it's really important that, that I, I spend a lot of time modeling around that. 
And this was an example of, of the kinds of vague generalized context that I noticed from my year 11 class a couple of years ago after their mock exams. And they were making very generalized comments that, that weren't particularly um, adept at showing their deeper thinking about the times and the text. So I introduced them to some more um, nuanced critical ideas and then gave them my model and I've broken it down to you into, into stages. So we have the initial statement, then we get the, the close language analysis, and then this is the key bit that they were getting wrong, that we really look about how we can have more advanced ideas about context. And I know you've not got time to look at that in detail and you can go back to that now, but it really did make a difference, the fact that I'd give them this model and, and encourage them to, to avoid these kind of wide generalizations that they were making about historical ideas. And this leads on to, to, I suppose, what is the key theme that runs throughout the book, this idea that I, I want my students, and I've said this flippantly before, that, that only fools really go into exams not having an idea about what they're going to write. And, and for me, I want my students to have a really good idea about this is my strength. This is my area where I really know my stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to take the question on and make the question fit my paragraphs. Now that done badly can be disastrous. So you've got to model it relentlessly. You've got to show how you can skillfully do this. And this is a key thing that I, I do. And, and for me, I'm absolutely key on some of the, the stuff that's been mentioned before about allusions, um, biblical allusions that Kat mentioned was, was key as well. But for me, having these pre-prepared sentences that I, I've got, that I've picked out, and I'm gonna adapt them to, to fit either in, in, in non-fiction or, or in my fiction writing. I'm gonna use these sentences to, to show off a bit. So this is a, a, a famous line that's an opening to, to a particular text. Some of you might recognize this. Uh, well done if you spotted, and it's a George Orwell essay, and he's writing about these German bombers that are kind of flying around circling overhead, and he's worried that he's gonna get bombs dropped on him. And I adapted this for a piece of my own writing for an article that I wrote for the test that was about line managing the maths faculty. And I, I adapted it and I was really, really pleased with myself with this clever illusion. And then, of course, the sub-editor um, got their hands on it and totally mangled it. Uh, but never mind, I'm, I'm not better about that. But, but it did give me a useful uh, way in for my students. And, and this is a, an example of, a, of something that one of my students wrote based on this model. And the key thing is my, my student became really confident that he could use this model regardless of whatever topic might come up um, for the narrative or for the uh, transactional writing or so on. But it's not just about sentences. I think you can go further and you can model these pre-prepared structures and paragraphs. And I'm going to show you an example that I love to use um, that, that would be perfect for transactional writing. And I call it the flipped circular structure. So we start off with the creative opening. Now, normally, when you're writing to argue, the expectation is you, you just do a straightforward um, argument. You get straight into your kind of um, statistics and your, your anecdotes or whatever it may be. I don't do that. I encourage my students to start with this little mini story. It's a narrative that sets the scene in an exaggerated, satirical way that makes the reader think, why are they telling me a story? They're meant to be doing a straightforward argument. And this is the kind of question you might apply to um, AQA, um, often use these kind of prompts. And this would be the kind of mini story that I would tell to begin with. And you'll notice there that it's got a couple of evolutions when you go back and look at it in a bit more detail. In between, you do all your normal argument, you do a few paragraphs of that, and then you come back at the end and you use the same sentence structures, almost the same words, except you twist it from, from a positive to a negative or from a negative to a positive, whatever way you want to take it. And this is something that my students were now going into exams thinking, okay, I've got this structure. I know pretty much what I'm gonna do based on whatever question comes up. And it really is quite liberating for them. So the final thing, and I'm running out of time, is just to say in terms of keeping them motivated, how can we use language as an English teacher to keep them want to engage with this revision process over the, over the case of two or three years or however long your GCSE is? 
We know from the research in, into motivation that telling them to do their best, to work hard, to, to, to crack on with it and to try isn't enough in itself. It has to be more specific than that. You can't just give them feedback saying you need to do more revision. You've got to be very precise about what that look like, looks like. So for me, the emphasis is on mastery over performance in terms of their goals. And, and what does that mean in reality? We have to make sure that whenever we're giving feedback and in the way that we speak to students after um, assessments and so on, that we're talking about failure as part of the learning process. It's an integral part of, of the learning process. Ignore um, the grade, ignore the marks, don't speak about the numbers unless you ha absolutely have to. And instead, focus on what can you do to make this a bit better. And if they can set those specific and challenging goals with your guidance, that's all the more better. Because for, for me, the emphasis has got to be on this competition as a, as a form of competing with your past self, this focus on continual gradual improvement. So what might that look like? You might say, okay, well, let's have a look at your exercise book. Your, your introductions in September were pretty poor. Let's have a look at them now in January. Yeah, they're far more um, convincing, far more impressive. Just imagine how good they're going to be by the time you get to the exams in, in May or June. And that's the kind of language and the kind of talk that I think will keep them motivated, will keep them tasting success and want to do more, uh, rather than trying to say, you got a four last time, if you work hard, you can get a five next time. Uh, so that's me, Don. One final plug for the book. Uh, it's out on the 25th of June, but you can, and I'd, I'd love you to pre-order it uh, now. Okay, thank you very much. I'd love to take some questions. Hey, Mark, thank you very much. That was great. Um, and the sound was very good after you switched off the video. So uh, can you stop sharing the screen and switch the video back on, please, so we can see you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it does say your network bandwidth is low, so I guess that was, <laughs> but it's working now, so it's good. Cool. So uh, we have a few questions. Before I start with the questions about the talk itself, there were some questions about your book. So if you can tell more about the book, is it aimed at students? Is it aimed at teachers? Does it work for all exam boards or is it focused on a specific one? Yeah, of course. It, it's aimed at students, but I think that the that, that teachers will find it very useful. And, and, and some of the English teachers that have looked at it have said to me, I'm going to buy this as an English teacher. I'm going to buy it for the department as an English teacher. But it is aimed at students as a revision guide. But as I say, it's different. Uh, most revision guides are, this is the stuff you need to know. Whereas this looks at the, the how in a real step-by-step -step stage, taking the student who, who really struggles to start with revision, at this, hopefully, ideally, at the start of the GCSE course, and takes them all the way through to the, the more complex ideas towards the end, such as rewriting, improving essays, and, and creative writing. Um, so yeah, so yes, that, that's that's the the key emphasis on, on, on the book. Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, so there were questions right in the beginning about note taking. Um, whether you advise only linear note taking, or do you also like mind maps uh, and our more visual notes for students? Yeah, I, I think you can do that within the Cornell notes. So I, I, I showed it just tended to be quite straightforward sentences and prose, but th there's no reason why diagrams and mind maps can't be part of that. The key part from, from the research that I've done into, into Cornell notes is that the, the statement or ideally the question is the key prompt. So if I had a question that would say something like, um, what are some of the key themes in Macbeth? And then the, the response to that was a mind map with those key themes from it. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, some questions about uh, pre-prepared responses. So there was one on, do you think that they can limit higher ability students or higher achievement students? And the other one, how do you actually recommend preparing them? That was more, but the chat's going on too fast. So I... Yeah, no, pre-prepared is always uh, a bit controversial. The exam boards don't like it, and it's one that's, that's, that's not for the purest of the English teachers. But I actually think that if, you, if it's done properly and you model each stage of it, it far from being limiting for, for the top students, it's actually something that's, that's liberating and stretches them and challenges them. So the idea of pre-preparing, I, I, I think, is, is this sense of, these are the, the elements that I'm particularly interested in, that I'm particularly fascinated in, that I'm particularly yeah. good at analysing. Um, 
so to go back to those statements that I said in terms of the, um, the retrieval practice uh, and, and using those as a way to think about how can we adapt those and make them fit a question that, that might not on the surface seem to be about that particular quotation. So far from saying, okay, I'm only going to allow you to write about this, I think it allows you to, to look at all the themes and all the ideas, but with the comfort of knowing that you've already got something interesting to say about it. And that's where the emphasis for me for prepared comes from. Interestingly, not long back, I was reading Stephen Fry's second autobiography, and he pretty much got through all of his Cambridge exams by doing pre-prepared responses. Um, so I, I, it, I don't think it's something that, that you, you can't do if you're clever. I think it, it, it has to be done carefully, but you have to spend a lot of time adapting it. So you'll give them a, a question, they'll write an essay, and then we clear to you'll say, okay, I want you to use the best bits from that essay, but for a totally different question. Let's see what, whether you can do that or not. So it requires um, adapting and a bit of amending as you go, but they really need to know their stuff to be able to do it. It's not, it's not a quick, easy um, approach. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what about when you talked about statements for deep thinking? Uh, there was a question from Abby asking if they are oral or written or both. How do they actually work in the classroom? Yeah, so what I tend to do is I'll, I'll give them, say, five minutes and put three statements up on the board. And they can either formulate a response where they write it down, they can make notes, or they can just have an oral response. But every pupil in the class has to be prepared for the fact that I'm going to call on them at some point. Mm -hmm. And, and I, will, I will do things like, um, okay, Stephen's given me this response. Um, Paul, what do you think? Do you, do you agree? Do you disagree? So we get a bit of a debate going from it, but I'm happy for them to write it down. Yep. Uh, and there was a question from Kelly saying that you were talking about introductions and conclusions, mm -hmm. but there seems to be very little reward for these in exam conditions. So how do you reconcile that in the classroom? Um, I disagree if they're done well. I think most introductions and conclusions get ignored by examiners because they they're just kind of waffly fluff that's filling a bit of time and ease, easing their way into it. If you look at some of the most effective introductions, they set out a step-by-step -step guide to the entire essay, and it, it, it's almost like a, an essay plan in brief. And if you look at some of the examples that I do in the book, um, I think that they're, they're really setting the stall out where they're, they're introducing complex ideas and complex themes. The conclusion, is a bit of a bonus, isn't it? Sometimes you don't have the time to do it, and but I, I just use a couple of key sentences as a way of wrapping things up. But again, it really does add to the overall mm -hmm. experience of the essay. And I think that the examples I show in the book would definitely pick up marks. Yep, good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the question didn't catch the name of the person, sorry, on uh, students struggling to have their own viewpoint and perspective on an essay question. So how do you help them with that? Um, to begin with, you give them your viewpoint okay. uh, and you get them to, to, to take that. And, and that's absolutely fine because you're, you're an expert. And then over time, you might start to, to say, well, what about this? And I think it's just something that can be, be very gradual, but there's nothing wrong where if you've got a student who is really stuck to say, okay, use my idea, like Patrice was showing earlier, copy down my paragraph, I'll give you a different quotation and see if you can adapt my paragraph for this quotation. There's nothing wrong with, with them taking your idea uh, as long as they're reformulating it in their own words. Over time, they get more confident. They've got the knowledge as a, as a, as a springboard. They, they might start to experiment a bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, there was a question from Jane here. How do, uh, to the whole chat, but also to you. How do you feel about students writing first person in analytical writing? She said she was taught not to use it, but she wants to know if that's changed recently or that's still the advice. Yeah, I, I, I tend to, to not model that. I, I, I don't find that those personal responses tend to work very successfully. You get the odd one that does and, and the odd example um, that stands out, but, but largely, the, the, the emphasis is, is using you know, more formal academic um, that sense of different different distance that sense of objectivity is, is wiser I would argue yeah 
And uh, just going back to pre-prepared responses, there was a question asking about um, what are they, are they whole piece of creative writing? Because that's what they do in their school. So is that something that you would advise? Yeah, it, ver it, it varies. I've had certain, certain students who will plan, say, two or three whole pieces of creative writing, and then we'll make whichever one is most applicable to the task that's given which are usually quite general that that will be used as their as their um piece mm -hmm. um, or others might just have little key paragraphs and they think this paragraph is going to go in there or it might even be they've just got a sentence like the, the illusion that i showed at the start the george orwell one it might just be okay that's going to be my opening it depends how confident these students are some people see this as a, as a kind of a shortcut as a bit of a cheat but bear in mind a student has memorized a full two-page um, highly skilled creative writing piece that picks up lots of marks. That's very useful for them in the future. That, that's not a shortcut. They've had to work really, really hard on that. So I, I don't see that as, as being something that's a problem, even though I know it upsets some of the, the purists. Yeah, <laughs> good. And a uh, more practical question from Emily. Uh, how do you have time to embed sentence modeling consistently? She says she tried during the for language, but didn't really get to do it because there was not enough time. I think it's so important that you, you have to make the time. I, I, I really do believe, uh, Patrice said earlier about doing it every lesson, and, and for me, what could be more important in terms of teaching writing than showing them how to, to construct sentences? And if you move away from the kind of a forest um, approach where it's, it's, it becomes a tick list or so on, you have time, you, you find time, and, and you can look at, at beautiful sentences from the literature text and just think, okay, let's have a go at adapting that for, for a piece of our own writing, things like that. The, the time is there if you prioritize it over other activities that, that aren't as, as necessary, I would argue. Yeah, and uh, I have two minutes left, so one more question. Uh, there was actually a lot of comments about Socratic learning, so I uh, just want to know your views on that, and your thoughts on that. In, in terms of um, when, when we're questioning students, um, I think that it, it's very important. I'm really looking forward to the, the talk that's coming up on Socratic learning. Uh, and it is something that, that I, I have used uh, with my students. But I think personally for me, that the, the key element of, of my classroom after the initial discussions is lots of, of written practice. Uh, so very much using the I, we, you approach, which I know many will be familiar with. Um, so that I will, I will model something, I will get them to work on it under my support and guidance and spending a lot of time going back and addressing those misconceptions, uh, but then giving them lots of opportunity to, to answer questions independently. That tends to be the, the key element of my teaching, but I, I, I'm fascinated when teachers do use Socratic yeah. techniques and do them really well. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was great. That was excellent. Uh, can you tell people again how to buy your book? Because there are lots of questions on how do I get that book? So. Yeah, so, so it's, it's available on, on Amazon. So it's called You Can't Revise for GCSE English. Yes, you can, and Mark Roberts shows you how. If you don't like buying off Amazon, uh, you can get it from the Collins uh, website, uh, so the Collins secondary website. Uh, and as I say, it's available for pre-order, and it will be out within the next I think, in 12 days' time. So yeah, very much looking forward to, to that. Brilliant, fantastic. And I just want to remind everybody who doesn't know Seneca yet that our whole point is to give revision tools to students. So in addition to everything that you do in the classroom, there is a free revision tool used by 3 million people already available for you covering, I think, 25 different texts, GCSC and A-level. So just go for it and give it a try. Thank you very much, Mark. Brilliant. Thank uh, you. Thanks, everyone. Next one is uh, Yamina. You there? Hi, everyone. I can't help you. I just want to do a double wave all the time, every day. I don't know why. I'm You're so sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, so just go for it. You can share your screen and start. Can you see that? Not yet. Yes. Hi everybody, I'm Yamina Vivi and I'm an assistant head teacher leading English in a school in East London. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my career journey. So um, 
about two weeks ago, I got the, the responsibility of leading um, English and it's been an exciting journey already. Before that, I was a lead practitioner and I'm an accredited lead practitioner with the SSAT and I've been doing that for five years before that. Um, and I've had a number of roles within the English department and outside of it, but my real love is English um, and it's always been my passion. So I'm really excited to be here. And the, I'm going to be talking about something that is actually a huge topic, um, but I've got 10 minutes to do that. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, I, tr I will try and slow down my talk, but um, it's interesting because exactly what I'm talking about is talk and the place of talk and oracy in the classroom in, in order to create independent thinkers through specifically dialogic teaching and the Socratic debate. Now, I became really interested in the Socratic debate when I witnessed my NQT mentor almost a decade ago now in the classroom facilitating this discussion where her students were really leading the discussion. They were probing each other, they were articulating their ideas about an unseen text, something they'd never studied before. Now, I was fascinated as an NQT about how she had managed the behavior, how she had created a culture and an environment where every student was engaged. And that kind of really got me thinking about the key questions that I was having. And I've kind of written them down here for, your, for, for you to see. So whenever I think about oracy and the place of talk in the classroom, particularly in the English classroom, but also across the curriculum, I think about, well, how do we know that effective discussions are actually taking place in our classrooms? How do we ensure that every student is engaged when discussions are taking place? And I'm sure that, you know, when we've had group discussion, I have definitely, where some students will opt out, they become passengers in the classroom. But how do we ensure that every student is engaged then? How do we create independent thinkers through debate and discussion? And how do we know that discussions will lead to thoughtful and developed ideas and writing? And I really want to make it clear that talk isn't just as a result, writing isn't as a result talk and talk isn't just for the purpose of writing that talk has a place individually is important and significant in the english classroom and i think you know when the government made the decision to make spoken language and speaking and listening just an endorsement they kind of diminished the role that talk can really have um, and when I saw my uh, mentor delivering the Socratic seminar, I was really interested to find out about the principles, sorry, the principles behind this Socratic seminar that got students to probe and engage where every student was involved in this discussion and debate in one form or another. And it was really important because it led me to this piece of research. So Robin Alexander's Towards Dialogic Teaching was the first thing I read. And, and more recently, actually, um, he's written a dialogic teaching classroom. And in it, he defines dialogic teaching as a pedagogy of the spoken word, which it harnesses the power of dialogue that stimulates and extends students' thinking, learning, knowing, understanding and enables them to discuss, reason and argue. Note that he doesn't once mention writing, although we will talk about that in a moment. In his piece of research, he discusses how dialogic teaching is almost reject, it rejects the traditional mode of classroom talk that centers around the IRF model. And I've, I've written down in brackets what that stands for. It's not to say that the IRF model where we initiate a question, listen to a student's response and kind of give feedback on that response isn't, doesn't have a place. It's just that when you, have a, when you are delivering the dialogic teaching in the Socratic seminar, it is almost rejecting that particularly, uh, particular model. And in it, he discusses these eight repertoires at the center of his re approach. And I am going to be honest, because the, the, the talk is mostly about this Socratic strategy, I am going to guide you towards the research. Um, because I won't delve too uh, deep into this. So he talks about the interactive culture, how we manage that talk, how we explain to students what the rituals and rules are essentially. He doesn't like to use the word ground, rule in his, ground rules in his research, but it's an easier way of understanding what he's talking about there. So for example, how do we get students to understand how they listen effectively, how they talk effectively? So you'll actually set it up in the classroom where you constantly remind them. And you can see how that links to the teacher standards of behavior for learning and high expectations. The interactive settings. He even considers how the classroom is set up. It talks about groupings. It talks about the time that's allocated. In the research, he talks about learning talk. How do we learn talk? How do, I, how, does our, how do our students learn that talk? And he even places emphasis on the way in which we as teachers talk, that we model those practices to our students. He then mentions these other repertoires of questioning, extended, discussion, discussing, and arguing. So 
as I said, I meant I saw this um, in my NQT year now over a decade ago. And I'm going to now go through the strategy and how you can implement it in your own classroom. So we, there are two different ways of doing it. So as he talked about in the interactive settings, we need to think about the groupings and the way the classroom space is set up. So the way Teresa Dunsey did it, who was my NQT mentor, was that the classroom was in a horse, horseshoe shape. You had a group of students who were part of the inner circle. They were going to discuss whatever was in front of them. So whether it was an unseen poetry te uh, poem, whether it was an unseen extract from a play they'd been studying, whether it was a short story, it could even be a student's piece of writing that you want to use as a model. And you have that stimuli that the students in the inner circle discuss. On the outer circle, you have the other students and they have a range of different roles. Now the outer, outer circle students, are also observing the inner circle students. There are specific students that might be tagged and allocated to watch the specific students. So student F might be asked to watch student A, for example. And they're given a success criteria that is co-created with you as a teacher. And I must kind of emphasize at this point that so much of the Socratic is about ensuring that you have a positive classroom culture where students feel safe to make mistakes, where students feel safe to be able to develop and discuss their ideas openly without fear of shame or rejection. That students really know that there are going to be no passengers in the classroom, that no one can opt out. So the outer circle, they're given this success criteria that you've co-created with them. They really understand it. Everybody in that classroom understands the success criteria. And I'll show you that in a moment. And then you'll also have these other roles. So you can develop the kind of thinking and the speaking and listening strategies and the, these repertoires that he talks about. So, for example, uh, Teresa used to include, and I, I've kind of continued her legacy, I guess, um, the listening skills. Well, who, there's going to be a specific student who looks at the whole group in the inner circle. Who's sustaining the con concentrated listening? How do you know they're listening? What do they do to show that they're listening? Who's sustaining the discussion? And these will all be different students looking at different things. You can even have students who kind of look at the metacognitive process. Well, where, when someone gets stuck, what happens? How do they overcome those barriers? What cognitive strategies do they actually implement? And how do they monitor and then evaluate those specific strategies? And what I tend to also do is have one student, usually my highest prioritainer, or stu a student that really loves to kind of contribute to the discussion on the outside. So you really personalize every kind of role for those students. And what I tend to do with that student is say, you are going to watch the discussion, you're going to make notes, and then what you're going to do is tell us what was left out of the discussion. And that is a really important aspect of kind of summarizing and synthesizing um, that discussion. You can also think about it as a mini Socratic. So the a whole school, a whole class discussion really does take a bit of planning, but really your role as a, as a teacher then is to facilitate that discussion. You might have a post-it note in front of you, write some sentence starters for students who aren't contributing to the discussion to encourage them. You could write a question down to get them to think about it so that they can still contribute to the discussion. What you could do though is to kind of ease your workload and your planning is have just this slide in front of you. So mini Socratic debate, you have a question like this. So priestess and inspector calls is socialist propaganda and is conditioning the youth to become lefties. You can see the success criteria that we've created here. We've co-created that success criteria and it's also something that we use later on in the writing. You then can see that the Socratic roles, and these aren't personalized. So with the whole class Socratic, I would actually write down individual students' names. You know, person A, B, C, D, E, F, you are going to do exactly this. And these roles might be linked to your success criteria, to your assessment objectives, like they are here. With a Socratic role, in, with the mini Socratic, you can kind of be a bit free, I guess, if you want to kind of ease your workload and your planning, where you just say, okay, you're going to be in these groups, you've put them in uh, groups, you decide in your groups which role you are going to have. Are you going to be part of the discussion? Are you going to be an observer? which specific roles, what you could do is could do is really guide those students and say, person A, I really want you to think about doing this particular role. And again, that's really personalized approach. And, and what you'll end up doing is the first time you do it, it can be a bit chaotic. I have to be really honest. That's what exactly what it was like with me. But the more you do it with the same class, the more you'll see how passionate they become, how excited they become. Every time I now say that it's Socratic, they love it, they absolutely love it because they get to explore their own ideas in a safe environment and in a safe culture. With the observers in the mini Socratic, again, they're making notes, you're guiding them on what they're making notes on. And then you can have the feedback se session. So this can be a whole kind of one whole period 
where you all you do is a Socratic debate, or you could minimize it. So you could have a 10 minute mini Socratic and then a five or 10 minute feedback. And what you then do is get the students to feed back to you. You can target those specific students, or you could kind of let the whole class give feedback on what they've noticed. What you then do is you as a teacher collate all their ideas. So you have now this bank of critical ideas and interpretations and analysis that you've got that have been generated by the students. And then you can use the I do, we do, you do approach um, to model how to then turn those notes into writing. And you might need to do that quite a few times as Rosenstein says, you know, small steps. But eventually you'll see that they can do it themselves because you modeled and scaffolded it for, scaffolded for them. If you would like to know more, there's, here's the information. I would really recommend you read uh, Robin Alexander's A Dialogic Teaching Companion. It's, uh, it's a bit cheaper on Kindle as well if you want to. And the EEF project that the research is kind of focused on is, um, I've got a link to that here as well. Thank you very much. You can contact me at it, Miss YBB or you can have a look at my um, blog for more for the resources too. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much. That was really, really good. I'm sorry, the coffee machine just went on. Uh, that was really, really great. Uh, so there are some questions here uh, from Emma. How do you encourage reluctant pupils to take part on those? Yeah. So because you have if you know your students really, really well, you will know exactly who will be reluctant and who won't be. And I think it's really important to have sentence starters. I, I provide sentence starters. I might provide questions to help guide them. And as I said in the talk, what I might do in my facility, like in my role as a facilitator is observe. I don't talk, I, I might probe, I might use questioning to probe them, but I might just have a post-it and write sentence starters on the post-it and just quietly leave you on the desk, which I used to see my mentor do. And I used to always wonder what she did. And I realized very quickly that what she was doing is engaging those reluctant those speakers and I, and I say that because I, I before lockdown that's something that you know dialogue teaching and Socratic seminars had a real place in my classroom and I had in my top set year 10 class you know I had these reluctant these students who were who were very good at writing but maybe not very articulate speaker well not were fearful of speaking in public um, and so by having those sentence starters or questions on the post and just putting it in front of them, you're also really supporting them. You're almost saying, I've got your back, you know, I won't let you down, I'm here for you, and I will ensure that you, you know, I, I will support you in any way. You're creating that interactive culture, like Robin Alexander says. I yep. hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. Um, there's a question about, I think similar, uh, but how do you go around this for students with anxiety or autism spectrum disorder? I think that this is really important. Again, it's that personalization. You really need to know and understand your students. So it might be that with those specific needs or students with complex needs, you might just get them to observe for, for the while. For the first couple of times, you might get them to observe. So they become more and more confident. And then you might ask them, would you like to be part of it? Because I think it's really important to, yeah, know your knowledge of your students is so key with the Socratic. Because yeah. um, if you don't know their needs, you're really going to struggle to control and manage that behavior as well. So that's why I say, you know, managing positive, creating a, an environment where positive behavioral learning is the norm is so important. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, there were two questions from Sophie and from Rima. They are kind of the same. So how do you effectively manage a debate like this so it doesn't go off topic and then if you do any preparation beforehand so that it gets less chaotic as possible yeah and this is where the i i'll share the resource with you but you can also see it in my blog there's a slide that i use and there's actually a worksheet a document that i might print out and it's got all their names on it every single student's name is on that document and they all have the roles that they're allocated, you tell them beforehand that important, I, I forgot to mention this, thank you for that. At the beginning of that Socratic debate, yeah. you as a teacher are still in charge. You need to establish the norms, you need to remind them of the norms and the expectations. And I'm not going to lie to you, I have had Socratics at the beginning when I was chaotic, especially mm -hmm. when I was an NQT and an RQT and was really struggling to manage everything. So I'd be lying to you if I said I, could, I, I was able to do that like this. It is something, as I said, dialogic teaching is something that it needs to be established time and time again. And it's something that you create. It's a culture you create in your classroom to manage that. You might want to stop that conversation if it does divert and say, OK, let's go back to it. Almost like a chairperson. Can we go back to it one person at a time? Or, you know, so you are reiterating as a teacher what the expectations are. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. There are lots of questions still coming. I'm just going to tell everybody to take that to Twitter because we only have time for one more. Uh, so, yep. 
Uh, so the last question is uh, very specific for this time now. Have you given any thought on how you're going to do that when we go back to class and we have to keep social distancing or small yeah. groups and etc.? Yes, I mean, I've done it in a group of like six students where three students have observed and three students have just kind of um, been part of the discussion group and then they swap roles so you have you can say you know you've got five minutes to discuss this and almost yeah. like a starter activity so you can read this is why I love it I think you know I get really passionate about it because you can use it as a starter a main a pe you know whatever you want really because it's so adaptable it's essentially placing talk at the heart of your curriculum placing talk at the heart of your classroom and, and giving the students the space to discuss something so it might be that like I have a starter activity yeah that focuses on Priestley's kind of a specific extract in the play. Let's just discuss very quickly. Let's use Socratics. And it is something I've been thinking about because we do remote live learning at Forest Gate Community School, which is where I'm kind of an assistant head. And I've been really thinking about how I can encourage this. And it is something that I've been thinking about. And I might write about it. Um, but if you have any ideas, guys, please let me know. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry you don't have more time. But thank you so much. I'm sure that you'll get a lot of questions on Twitter after this. Um, so next one and our final speaker for the day is Jennifer Webb. Jenny, you there? Hello all. I'll just Hello. share my screen. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Here we go. Yep. Can you all see that? Yes. Marvellous. Okay. So um, good morning, afternoon. It's quarter past 12. Um, it's such a pleasure to be closing this conference. It's been brilliant. Um, it's been a real delight to see all the other speakers um, because a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, I think, fit in with some of the things I've been saying. So the things that Patrice was saying about modelling and about kind of having that um, really obvious, almost kind of metacognitive process being made really explicit to students. And what Yamina was just saying, sorry, Yamina was just saying now about um, Socratic talk and asking the right questions and prompting and probing um, are all gonna kind of come into what I'm gonna talk about. So my name is Jenny. I am the Assistant Principal for Teaching and Learning at Corp Academy Leeds, um, which is um, a large secondary school um, in the inner city. Um, I've written a couple of books which you can see there and you can get on Amazon if you want but all the resources from all my books are available for free on my website so please check that out. Um, okay so what I'm going to talk about is some of the things in my literature book but kind of enhanced by lots of the things that I've been thinking since because I wrote it kind of a while ago now so I want to talk about the balance in the English classroom between learning stuff, which is really important, and learning how to think using that stuff. So by stuff, I mean all of that key content, facts, dates, names, conventions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm a massive believer in teaching um, a really heavy knowledge-based curriculum and making sure we keep the challenge really, really, really high and make sure our kids know lots and lots of things. I'm all for um, anything that's about getting students to learn and retain information um such as kind of high level vocabulary and symbolism and context and all of that stuff it's really really critical but they must then be able to give that stuff some meaning they must be able to do something with it which is not only going to make sense but also is going to really really advance their arguments so what i want to talk about is how we can create literary thinkers and something that I've been playing with a lot more in the last year is thinking about sequences of questions which are essentially building towards metacognition. So what I want my students to believe about themselves and to understand um, in my classroom is that when they are studying literature, they are literary critics they are contributing to a wider body of critical work. So when they write an essay, they're they become part of that critical world of all the other people, all the academics, everybody who has ever commented on that same text or that same theme or idea. Um, so in that way, they are taking part in a timeless conversation about art, because essentially that's what we're doing in literature. We're talking about art. It's all about um, kind of admiring and commenting on and exploring and interrogating something that another human being has created. Um, 
we're also giving shape to that art so it's a really important thing for them to understand that by engaging with a novel or by watching a play or by reading a poem and interrogating it and pulling it apart they give shape to that art they give meaning to that art you could argue in many ways that it's not a poem unless it's read um and that by engaging with that text in the first place you give that you give it substance okay um another thing that i want them to understand is that they are also a social commentator so by interrogating literature and exploring it and enjoying it they're able to make comments about or have a better understanding of what that text tells us about the society in which it was created or what the reception of that text tells us about wider society now etc etc and the big one for me is always about the human condition and if you've been in any of my cpd sessions recently you'll kind of have heard this before so the idea that to study literature is to observe the human condition and i want my children my students in my classroom to see all of these things as being part of their study of literature to study literature is to become all of these things so what i'd like them to be doing is um to become explicitly aware of the work that they do so that abstract thing of talking about why a curtain is blue um, becomes something really, really tangible and meaningful because actually they're not just talking about a blue curtain, they're not just talking about a symbol, they're talking about that symbol and how it relates to things in a broader sense, okay? So for anyone who's not really, um, so sorry, yeah, uh, it's not just about the final product, it's about consciously going on a journey. So it's not just about the essay they produce or the exam mark they get. It's about consciously going on a journey to explore and understanding the stages of that journey for yourself. So for anyone who doesn't know what metacognition is, I'm just going to say very, very, very quickly. Metacognition is a, just a fancy word for thinking about thinking and being aware of your own thoughts, your own thought processes. Um, so essentially it's about being able to say with a piece of work, um, I recognise that I found this difficult, that I overcame it in this way, and that um, these things helped, or this was really challenging because in the future, I'm going to approach this differently in this way. Um, there is a huge amount of research that suggests that students who are able to think and work metacognitively make an additional seven months of progress in a 12 month um, period um, i would recommend checking out alex quigley's work on metacognition with the education endowment foundation so there's an eef report on metacognition which is excellent as a starting point um, so one of the one of the statements i had at the start was you are giving shape to the art you encounter okay so what that means for my students is that in real life they're presenting clear well thought out well expressed interpretations so writing a really good essay um which expresses very clearly what you think about it okay and like i said is it a novel if it isn't being read do we as the readers give it life because otherwise it's just words on a page so getting my students recognize that their reading of it adds um actively turns this into an experience okay rather than just words on a page is really, really important so um, one of the ways that I try and get my students to think about this is by looking at revision and redraft so I know you can all read but I'm just going to read this to you so Patricia Taylor um, who is a, um, a lecturer in academic writing in the states um, who's brilliant says that revision so redrafting is about seeing again it's not just about fixing spelling, punctuation and grammar. It's about seeing what you have written again. So revision is about the real work of addressing one's failures in thinking, not merely in typing and proofreading. So when students um, redraft an essay, it's not just about them checking what's wrong in terms of the practical stuff like spellings. It's about them addressing how well they have expressed an argument. It's about the content and the process of their own thought. Um, much of the academic writing process is flexible and recursive. It assumes that failure will be a necessary component. While there is a general order to these things, at any point a failure might, might cause us to return to an earlier step and begin again. So I think this is a really, really important point. If we want our children to be literary thinkers, we need to get them to embrace redrafting as a way of seeing again their own arguments and interrogating them and making sure they are um, so i like to get my students to be conscious of that writing process they know from the start they're going to draft and redraft they know that this is part of the way that they develop their ideas um, so here's an example often i'll get students to write a an essay and then um 
I will, this is quite an old example because you can see at the bottom it says, this is an A star paragraph, nailed it. And we don't have A stars anymore, but never mind. Just a good example. Um, it's about revisiting the work at every stage. So once they've done their process and they've written an essay, I like to get my students to go back and, ex and um, articulate for themselves. I did X, then I changed Y and Z. Um, sorry, Y and Z was the impact. Then I changed P and Q was the impact. So they're able to see that redrafting is very, very powerful. They're able to say, oh, do you know what? During that essay process, I changed the way this was phrased or I changed the way I introduced this critical viewpoint and this was the impact on my writing, this made it better. Then I changed this and this was the impact. And it's about them constantly going back and reminding themselves actually that redrafting is really important. You're hammering it home. If you don't redraft, you don't get better. If you don't redraft, you don't have a beautiful kind of, um, a beautiful piece of writing that is really, really well expressed, okay? So that's really important. So some of the questions that I think about um, for my students, what did you change in your second draft? What was the impact? How can you ensure you're right at this level the first time, next time? And what's the next step? So it's always about saying, what did you do? How did you change it? Will you ensure that this is better the next time you do it? So the next time you start at a higher level and then you can go even further. An example of one of my students, um, so this is a student who's quite severely dyslexic. Um, and we've been working a lot on phrasing um, and vocabulary. So um, this is one of his more, this is one of his later pieces of writing once we've been working on that. And we went through this process and we did lots of, what did you change in this draft? T show me what you changed. Was it effective? How, why was it effective? What has it done? You can link that to an exam spec if you want to, but you really don't have to. Um, how can you make sure that you always do this next time and then we can do the next step? So for example, this student is suddenly starting to highlight in his own work. Oh, I used words like, phrases like on closer inspection, upon first glance, words like fragile. I've said that something is a pivotal moment. In a previous draft, he might have said, um, this is an important quote. Whereas saying on closer inspection, we can see how profound this is or something like that. Or saying um, this, is a, this is a moment where the character feels tense. Actually saying this is a pivotal moment in the play is a far better use of um, phrasing and vocabulary. So through using repeated questions like this, where I'm getting them to think about the metacognitive process, think about the importance of drafting and identify all the good stuff that they've changed they do it better the next time and every single time they get better and better and better it just accumulates okay um getting students to be a literary critic to understand that they contribute to that wider body of work and understand that they are taking part in a timeless conversation um is really really important for me so i'm this is again quite a lot of text but i'm just going to explain it to you so kenneth burke who's a philosopher um basically kind of imagined this um this kind of coffee parlor okay that is going on forever and it's been going the coffee parlor has been open since the beginning of time and people started to write in that parlor um there are people you come in and there are people having a really heated discussion okay they are talking over each other they're responding to each other and they're talking about texts so let's say for example they're all talking about women in romeo and juliet okay you walk in you can hear people having conversations, you sit down, you listen, you think about whether or not you understand what their argument is, and then you start to put in your own arguments, okay? Um, you make your point, somebody answers you, you answer them, another person adds to your point or um, argues against you, whatever. You become part of that literary conversation, and then eventually when you're a bit tired and it's late, you leave, but the conversation's still going on. Since you've been there other people have come in and people have gone out and it's just this constant discussion that is what kind of Kenneth Burke sees the the kind of the world of literary theory being the idea that anybody can contribute to the discussion so you might have um Stephen Greenblatt talking about new historicism in that text um at some point in that coffee house's history when you come in later on, you're contributing to the same conversation. So I want my students to understand that when they write an essay or when they espouse an opinion about a text, they are equally making really, really important contributions to that 
wonderful conversation over time okay and that's really 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 important um that they are um no matter whether they are 15 year olds reading a play for the first time or they have three phds and they're lecturing in a university they are all contributing to that academic conversation and they should always be aspiring to that so um, one of the ways I do that, oh, this is this is not working the way I want it to. That's really annoying. So behind that box there, that you'll see there are some statements underneath. So I'm just going to give you kind of an example. I've done the, the animation wrong, unfortunately, but never mind. Um, I have a list and it's on my website anyway, but I have a list of um, statements about texts, which I give students. And these, the ones that I've done as examples are from the AQA Power and Conflict Anthology, but there are lots of others you could use. And essentially, I use statements about texts to get students to engage with, um, to, to engage with opinions and be confident as commentators on, um, commentators on kind of literary ideas. Um, I want them to be engaging with those as much as possible and to feel confident to give their own opinions. So for example, one of these things at the bottom that you can actually see, it says such and such, so writer's name, constantly challenges the views of society and interrogates the reader's own preconceptions. Is that something you agree with? Is that something you disagree with? Okay. Um, so and so name is consumed by emotion and unable to control the fury they feel. Do you agree that in um, exposure, Blake, not Blake, haha, <laughs> Owen um, is consumed by emotion and unable to control the fury he feels as a writer. Is that something that just oozes out of the poem or is that something that you think is actually more contained? So getting my students to engage with that argument and decide. Um, writer's name articulates the pain they feel at being mistreated and misunderstood by their own country. That's a statement that um, uh, about um, the poem em The Emigre by Carol Rumans. So Rumens articulates the pain that the speaker feels at being mistreated and misunderstood in their own country, in the country of their birth. Um, sorry, not the country of their birth, the country that they now live in. So again, giving them an, a statement about a text and getting them to engage with it is about kind of getting them used to um, giving their opinion and making them think that they're critics. And I always say to my students, what do you think though? No, but your opinion is really important. You're a critic. If you're going to use a critical viewpoint in your essay if you're going to say that you know you know a marxist theorist would think this or would argue this you need to feel confident enough to handle that material you need to be able to say it like you're just as good as a marxist theorist that you can um confidently put forward these ideas like you know what you're talking about you're a boss and that when um when you then engage with it and say however i think this might be a more useful way of looking at it or actually in addition i find this um to be an interesting thing to consider blah 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 you need to be able to add to that conversation without being scared of it okay um another resource that i like to use and again this is on my website in order to get students to engage with critical ideas and be part of that conversation in a meaningful way is that I give them this statement card which you can see on the screen now uh, with the green border so I in the middle you give them the statement or the viewpoint or the question that they're engaging with what they do with that um, and this is explained on my website in quite a lot of detail so you can see it there but what they do with that is that they first of all they look at the words used in the statement so they define the terms what could those words mean? What else could they mean? How are you personally defining them? They look at the context of the statement. So does the context of that statement matter? Does it change the nature of the statement if you have a different context? What's its natural solution to the problem or question? Could you change the statement to make it better? That's a really powerful thing to do because sometimes some of the best essays I've ever seen, particularly at A-level, are where students at the very end say, um, the question I'm answering, so they're essentially saying the question I'm answering is an interesting one, but a more pertinent question about this text would be this. And that's a really powerful thing. It shows that the student has taken complete ownership of the task. Um, range, what's the range of impact of the statement? Is this just a, a statement about human, human, a human being? Or is this about all human beings? Is it a global statement? Is it something about what we are as humans or is it something about what this particular group or this specific person is like okay um, and then the extremes what are the extreme applications of the statement so um so um 
does it become really, really ridiculous if you take it to its extreme, etc. So here's an example. Um, so if the statement is literature is just a pale shadow of real life and is therefore unable to tell us anything new, then we might go start with words. How do you define literature? Is it just the classic works of the canon or does it include everything that's ever been written? What do we mean by new? New to who? Does literature actually have to offer new things? Um, so you're interrogating all of the vocabulary, all the ideas in that statement, okay? Because that's important. They have to be able to attack it and feel confident enough to attack it because that is what a good academic would do. Um, context. What are the different contexts? So reading for pleasure is a different context to academic study, for example. Um, a solution. Literature shouldn't have to tell us something new and it certainly doesn't have to be an exact mirror image of real life. So well, let's change the statement. We could change the statement to literature should reflect, distort, magnify and illuminate elements of human experience. So actually, um, let's let's change it, change it to make it um, more powerful. Um, range and extremes. I won't go through those in detail because I want to get through everything but you can have a look at that on the website and that's a really nice way of getting training students to address a really difficult idea um, so you could use a critical viewpoint if you're trying to teach them feminist theory get a statement in the middle get them to work through it it works really really well um, so in terms of the questions for my metacognitive questions for getting students to engage in the conversation um, be what do you think what is your opinion have you read and understood the key arguments? Um, I talked at the Lit Drive CPD about getting students to do a literature review, and I've put the resources on my website, um, but it's in my most recent book in the academic writing chapter. Um, can highly recommend getting students at all levels, even from year seven, to write a literature review. Anyway, next one. How far have you engaged with these arguments? So what are the key arguments in this area? So like we said, present the presentation of women in Romeo and Juliet. What are the key critical arguments in this area? How far have you engaged with these arguments? How have these arguments contributed to your own thesis? So have you just listened to them and you like a brick wall and it hasn't changed the way you think? Or have you allowed those arguments to adapt and shift and alter the way that you think? Because that's what an academic does. They don't just ignore and stick to their their one idea that they had at the start they allow their reading to adapt how they think and um, what further work do you think needs to be done and how will you address this so in future in another essay what other reading would you want to do is there something missing okay um, and how will your approach to critical perspective be easier next time so next time i'm going to start at this point next time i'm going to make sure i do this this and this so it's about that what did you do how did it help and what's your plan for next time? That's the essential um, um, theory of metacognition. Recognising what you did, thinking about whether it was good, whether it was bad, what worked, what didn't work, and then how will it be different next time? Okay, and the last bit is on being a social commentator and observing the human condition. And this is the bit for me that students often find really, really abstract and difficult, but essentially all it's saying is, you need to be able to say, what's this telling us about people? what are the characters like what are we supposed to think about these characters what events happen what we're we supposed to think about them what's the writer trying to say overall so one of the resources i quite like to use for this is um this um this is actually a way of comparing two poems and two narrative voices in two poems but essentially it's an ab it's a way of taking abstract ideas like um the the emotional and mental kind of state of the speaker in a poem and finding a way to visually represent it so getting students to answer questions like how does the speaker feel um what kind of language imagery is being used how does the reader feel um and getting them to think really really carefully about what is going through the, the head of that um sorry what is going through the head of that figurative or sorry um what am i saying going through the head of that um fictional person generally unless it's a direct um speech from the poet themselves um, but there's an example of one that's been done by a student um, i showed this in a, a a drama session the other day but it's worth showing again um, i like using this and i developed this um after a conversation with kat howard on twitter actually because she's so clever um, but taking um looking at how a character 
um, is presented physically. So how do they act, move, speak? What do they do to show you how they're feeling? How are they presented emotionally? So how, what does the character say about their feelings? How does their language and the things they do show us what they're thinking and feeling? And then psychologically, so what is the overall statement being made about the character's mental state? How have they been impacted by events and ideas? what is the character trying to say and what, how is the reader supposed to react to the character's experience so we go from the literal to the kind of more symbolic the broader kind of ideas and those getting students to think in that way getting students to think about characters and what they're doing and how they're thinking can be really, really important i also like to use a list of questions apologies for the poor animations on this slide but never mind so the first thing um i give my students a list of questions often to help them interrogate a text so um here are some of them as examples so what are the moments of highest tension in the text how do characters act under pressure um so how characters act under pressure can tell us a lot about how the writer feels about human beings and how they act under pressure and um, when people are put in extreme situations often the most powerful representations of their beliefs come out i mean we can see that right now with the black lives matter movement things have come to such a heightened emotional um point where people cannot take the treatment anymore they can't take the systemic um abuse anymore and all of a sudden it's a pressure cooker and it's just gone and that's telling us a lot about how people behave when they feel um, completely powerless and they feel completely kind of overwhelmed by emotion. And that's really, really important for us to take note of. Um, and we can do the same thing when we look at literature. We can look at how characters behave when they are feeling, experiencing extreme grief, how they behave when they are um, backed into a corner, how they behave when they are drunk how they behave when they um, are really, really happy or really, really jealous, all of those things. Um, what are the events that make people change their mind? What are the most obvious meaningful symbols at the start? That's important. So what's setting the weather in the text? What's the first thing we see? What are the key meaningful symbols at the end? So what are the things we're being left with? Um, are there any events, actions or decisions which will be difficult for the audience or the reader to empathise with or forgive or forget? There are always those moments where you go, oh, that's evil, or I can't believe they did that, or I will never, ever, ever forget that moment in that text. If anyone's read The Long Song by Andrea Levy, the final kind of realisation of what has happened um, in that, and I won't give you a spoiler, but it hits you like a train when you realise what has happened. And that will never, ever, ever leave me. I honestly thought I was going to be sick when I finished that book. It's amazing, read it. But it's one of those moments where you just go, oh, the reader will never get over that. They will never forgive that. Um, do you get a sense that people can, can't do or don't change? Can people be good or have no choice? Or are they both good and evil? Um, is there a sense that people are responsible have control or are they not responsible at all and it's all about fate um is life hard easy a test a trial a punishment a gift people are fickle vulnerable weak strong ignorant selfish what is the writer saying and these questions for me often help students to get to that point where they're able to observe humanity through the text um here are some examples of kind of statements students have come up with so blake presents an image of humanity which is fundamentally weak and cruel um i won't read them all but it's a really really nice kind of way of getting students to go through those questions and then use those questions and their answers to them to create powerful statements and this resource is on my blog and this helps my students to then take all that understanding and structure a really beautiful um statement if that makes sense so there's an example there i won't talk you through it but it's it's on my blog and it's all free this is called the bird's eye view um statements resource i think so here are the metacognitive kind of questions. Have you considered what this text tells us about wider human issues? What are the key messages? How do they manifest themselves in your essay? Have you expressed yourself clearly? Is it plausible? How does this approach improve your academic writing? And how might you link your understanding of this text, wider themes, to your next literature study? So again, what were your ideas? What have you done? Was it successful? How did it help? And how will you do it again? So it's all about those questions getting students to be able to take that abstract oh i'm reading a book and talking about my feelings to a tangible um 
I am a literary scholar. I am taking part in a conversation. I am observing what human beings are through the art that they create. And these questions really, really, really help me to get my students to that point. And those questions might be given on the board. They might be questions that I ask them verbally. They might be questions that are on resources. It might be a prompt that I use in marking. It might be something that I go through as an actual resource that has all the questions on it and they're filling it all in. Um, it's variable, but it really, really, really helps um, in my experience. So I hope that wasn't just a load of waffle. Um, hopefully that was helpful. I'm going to stop screen sharing in a second go back into this um yeah there we are you. yeah brilliant thank you very much danny that was great uh and uh we have some questions here for you so i just want to before that just thank everybody for staying in this conference and coming and learning with us we really do appreciate that uh so question from Jen jessica how do you create a culture where students think beyond the literal? She says she finds it really hard and usually she does the heavy work. So she offers the interpretations and all of that. Yeah, so I think um, building on what um, Mark said in his talk um, and what um, Patrice was kind of saying, this idea that um, we really, really have to model that stuff. There's nothing wrong with saying to kids, um, this is what I think it means because you are the expert, you're the person who knows what they're talking about. And the more you do that, um, the more confident they can be that they're standing on solid ground and literal things are really important. They have to feel like they're talking about something real. Otherwise it just becomes this, this, this ankylous kind of place where you get lost, I think, literature sometimes, especially if you're reading a big long novel. Um, children can get kind of lost in it and they need something to ground them. So take that literal stuff, that resource that I showed you with the physically, emotionally, psychologically, starts with what do they actually do? So it's a literal thing. This character walks across the stage and does this thing. That's a really easy thing for kids to talk about. If they then take that to at the next level and think about well what does that tell us about how they're feeling or what does that tell us about what the writer kind of is 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 getting at and then take that to the next level and think well actually if that is what the writer is presenting what does the right how does the writer want us to extrapolate that is there an application for that beyond and it's about building it up i think so model it model your thinking tell them the answers and over time they will start to do it for themselves it's all about all about modeling and those questions it's nothing new going through like questions to help them structure the way they think the questions i've just given you on those slides they are the way you go from um like this is what i did to this is why and that was why it was powerful and this is how it's enhanced what i'm doing and actually it frees them to start doing that more regularly i think yeah that's a very good answer very detailed that's great um and then there are a couple of questions more practical so about your idea of getting them to draft and redraft doesn't that increase uh teacher working load uh, workload no, and marketing no. load too much so let me um make this really clear yeah. i do not write on student work ever i don't do written marking it's a massive waste of time um what i would say is um think about how you mark full stop and obviously that's not always in your control that's maybe your head of department or head teacher or whatever but um there's a blog on my um there's a post on my blog called zero written feedback a trial and have a look at that that kind of explains what i do but basically i'll read everything they've done mm. i will not write on it so it'll take me a minute to read what they've done it will take me five minutes to mark um so i can read everything in 30 minutes the idea is not that I should be doing the work for them. The idea is that redrafting, oh, thank you, someone just put the blog link in the chat. Um, but the idea is that they should be doing the work. They're, it's their work, it's mm -hmm. their stuff. It should yeah. not be up to me to carry 30 kids. It should be up to them to lead their own learning. So basically they write something and then I will give them a whole class feedback with questions and did you do this did you do this a lot of people didn't do this you need to make sure that you weren't one of those people go back and fix it so it gives them directions on how to improve that work um but they have to do it themselves it is not my job to circle every capital letter for them to then ignore what i've done um i'm over that i'm not about that life anymore yeah <laughs> sounds good uh, i think that also answers claire's question that was about how can you do all of the revisiting and redrafting when you have a whole curriculum to cover and exam boards? 
well that that's a really good question um and a lot of people say that um i talk about this quite a lot in my new book and it's about slowing everything down um so rather than teaching say um a unit on um a particular novel and writing a, an essay every single week that's on a different topic i would rather see students spending write fewer essays but write um a few essays um lots and lots of times and make them perfect it's about making sure that we're not writing six essays that are all a bit rubbish and then we've moved on and not learned a lot from it and actually writing three essays or even two essays that are awesome because once they've done that they have a really really good grasp of what excellent writing looks like and then when you get to, by the time you get to key stage four students know what a brilliant essay looks like and then you can start showing them how to do that in shorter time and yeah. you know that's that's the key um yeah yeah good um so question from emma how would you encourage low ability students who are reluctant to engage with texts and struggle to see beyond the literal to engage and push up their thinking so again it's, it's about giving them those questions for me modeling is absolutely vital so patrice's talk was really really good i model every single lesson i model sentences i model the way i speak and think through things i model how i annotate stuff i model how i annotate a line and then that turns into a point and then i might write about it it's absolutely crucial that they see that all the time and with lower but i mean for me, lower prior attaining students often like do better at literature than they would at language because literature is about them being able to express interesting opinions. It's not about fluency. It's not about perfection. It's not about it's not about spelling, punctuation and grammar and all of that stuff being technically accurate. They could get a decent mark in literature by saying brilliant things, even if the way they say it isn't awesome. Student getting those students up to the symbolic getting them up to that higher level is about modeling it all the time don't if you've got students who have got a target of a three don't model a four model an eight and it's your job as a teacher to scaffold up to that to find a way to open that up for them teach them sentences like what mark was saying like breaking down and getting them to literally um um learn sentence structures i do it all the time this yeah. is how you do it when they make a point my students always go writer's name analytical verb make your point comma quotation they know that it's like a formula and they can always just get in it's about modeling 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 at high standards all the time and they'll get there and even if it means that at the start they're kind of copying you and paraphrasing you that's great because mimicry leads to embedded understanding leads to independence yeah do you explain those things to them, this like cognitive work? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I tell them what they're doing all the time. Students can understand educational theory just as well as we can if we explain it properly. And remember, we're teachers. So if we tell them, this is what you're doing, and actually this is why your brain likes it. I tell my kids that all the time. They understand why they do recall at the start of every single lesson. They understand that. I mean, as an aside, we use Seneca in my department. We love Seneca. My students love Seneca. I have students who don't engage very well with homework, who were doing like five hours of Seneca quizzing a week last year before their exams on literature. Yeah. Amazing. So like, tell, I tell my kids, you do recall all the time for these reasons. This is cognitive science. If you'd like some examples of resources of how to explain cognitive science to your kids to get them more engaged, um, again, I've got a blog on memory and recall, which okay. shows, shares the exact way that I do it with my students. But yeah. they all get it. They all understand it. They all know the theorists involved as well. <laughs> I'm like, you're clever enough to understand this. I'm going to tell you. Yeah, um, yeah that's good. I, I agree with that completely. Um, so there was a question asking, what is your first thing that you do with a class when you start a new text or a new poem? How do you introduce it and how do you hook them, the students? Okay, so for me, I try not to think too much about hook because it, from there you kind of get into the dangerous zone of how do I make it fun? And I don't want to make it fun. I want it to be really hard and I want them to just engage because they value their education and they want to succeed. So I always start longer texts with a, with a cold read, like we just read it start to end or we read most of it and get through the story so they know the story and then we go back and study it properly again i have a blog on that so have a look if you want to check out a cold read but yeah. with if it's a poem i read them the poem read the poem sometimes i prepare a reading of the poem um and it's about them hearing it the way it's intended to be read um i don't get students to read it the first time because they always do it wrong um and also if it's a poem that requires a particular accent that is not an accent that you can do um 
respectfully, then please don't do it. Please don't read John Agard with your your fake um, Caribbean accent because that's very mm-hmm. offensive. Uh, <laughs> find a recording online. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. Um, sorry, uh, there was a comment from Bella. I just want to know your thoughts on that. Um, when studying plays, it's also very helpful to get students to look at what other characters say about another character before they appear. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so students' views are changed or reinforced when the character actually appears. Is that yeah, something that you work with them? Yeah, I think that's a really, really interesting idea because um, we have to look at, so we can look at a character through lots of different lenses. We can look at a character through the lens of um, other characters. So what do other characters say about them? What do they think about them? What have they said they've done or said as well? So have they already been paraphrased or quoted before they arrive? Um, we can look at characters through the writer's description of them or what they're wearing, what their context is, where we see them first, what they're holding, what they're doing first. That's really important. But we can also look at characters how a through an, um, the lens of how they are used as a vehicle through the text. So I always say to my students, characters aren't real people, they're a literary device. So they can't start psychoanalyzing a character and saying, but maybe they've got bipolar disorder. Yeah, no, they don't because they're not real. Um, so they're actually just like a vehicle that the writer is using to drive us through that text. They are a thing. Um, And so we have to look at them in that way as well. So how does that character um, help to introduce key themes? How do they contribute to moments of climax in the text? What is that character's job? Is it their job to antagonize? Is it their job to, um, to act as a catalyst for something? You know, someone like Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet is just this totally um, two dimensional character who doesn't develop in any way, but he's there to do a particular job for Shakespeare. Shakespeare's not interested in developing Tybalt. He's interested in getting him into a fight and then killing him off so that he can move on to something else. But Tybalt serves a really important role in the text. Does that make sense? So we have to look at characters through lots of different lenses, I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, And then a question from Kat. Uh, Would you introduce literary criticism at GCSC? If there is not merit for quoting literary critics, or is this more aimed at A-level students? I would t- introduce literary criticism in year seven. Yeah, um, I think that if we start thinking what's credited at GCSE, that's all I'm going to teach, then we limit our, our subject to being about exams. Our subject is not about exams. Our subject is about children being able to appreciate art. That, that's what it is. It's about children being empowered to look at what's around them, and have their lives enhanced by reading books and reading poems and seeing plays. It's not about getting a grade. What should happen is we teach our subject really, really bloody well. Year 10 and 11, we help children to um, gear themselves towards that exam, but that's kind of the byproduct of everything else we've done. It's just a side, like side product. They'll do well in their exam if we teach really well from the start. And I teach my kids literary theory from the start. Um, And if you want some tips like, couple of the ones that I find easier to teach start with new historicism because it's very easy um uh, something like um I quite like queer theory and performance theory um because they're not I mean uh, because again they're kind of a really good way of looking at drama um but yeah just do it do it all like don't limit them who if we let Michael Gove dictate what we teach in year seven, eight, nine, as well as year 10 and 11, then we're just, we're just capitulating. Sorry, I shouldn't get political. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, we are out of time. So it's almost 1 p.m. I wanna, can all the speakers switch your cameras back on so we can have like a final bye-bye to everybody. Thank you so That's much. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers and thank you so much to all the 950 people that joined us today that was really really amazing and we were trending number two on twitter just behind the queen's birthday which i think it's not really a loss (laughs) good enough so thank you very much and uh i'll be sharing that link that link has all the slides from all of the speakers Every recording is going to go to youtube so you can sign up to our youtube channel and get updated with all the free cpg that we do Cat's course on uh, Stop Talking About Wellbeing is already available on Seneca and all the other free resources on Seneca are already available for you and your students. So thank you very much to everybody and have a lovely Saturday. Bye.